you know, Congress is in charge of the Congress created the Fed and uh, and Congress could put a leash on it at any time. But they don't because the Fed is like the drug dealer for Congress, you know, mm -hmm. um, and Congress is very corrupt, as we've seen. They they do not care what the public thinks, as we can see from some of their recent you know, votes, you know, um, they don't. And it's bipartisan. I've uh, I told people get out of the D versus R trap. It's a it's a dead end. Um, they're both awful uh, in different ways. You know, they they primarily try to push people's buttons on, um, you know, cultural issues, but they're both horrible. They're run by horrible people. There might be good people here and there, but um, uh, it, it yeah, it's, it's just um, Congress and the Fed enable each other. Uh, Congress could, could end the Fed. Uh, I mean, I'm not delusional. I don't I don't expect the Fed to be ended, but I love to joke about it. Um, mm -hmm. We survived without the Fed. The Fed is, I call it for years, a private bank cartel, you know. Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Today, we're going to go beyond the headlines to the truth and reality in economics, finance, and life with Rudy Havenstein. He's a German lawyer and president of German Central Banks during hyperinflation. So I guess that makes you 167 years old. Is that right? Yeah, well, roughly. I feel that sometimes. <laughs> so how are you doing over there, Rudy? Good. Pleasure to, pleasure to be on with you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. You are a very well-known internet personality. I love your Twitter. And if everyone hasn't checked you out yet, you know, you expose the truth in economics, finance, politics, and life. And that's so important. Um, you go beyond the headlines. And I'm going to use a quote from your Twitter. Um, your way of joking is to tell the truth. And your Substax is pretty amazing. I just recently subscribed to it. You have a lot of fun with our ridiculous financial <laughs> system. Yeah. And it's not shot and fraud. It's deja vu. So I'm excited to speak with you. So why Rudy? Why the guy who was the big money printer proponent yeah. and um, who did not follow the quantity theory of money? Why Rudy? I think at the time it was 20, it's actually 11 years ago this month that I started doing this. And I think, um, and I'd been, you know, um, doing writing things for friends and stuff, emails for, for years and years. And, and I, and I think I, I thought, Oh, this Twitter might be a good outlet for me. It's, um, uh, as I, I tell people, it keeps me from over trading. So, you know, uh, during the day, but, um, I think Rudy was, uh, you know, I knew I was familiar with the history of, the central bank in Germany, the hyperinflation. And I did a lot of reading on it. And I particularly focused on the effect of hyperinflation on the people. And every contemporary account you read of that period um, describes how it's horrible for the vast majority of the population. The big industrialists, the big capitalists, um, they make it through fine. In fact, they 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 make more money during hyperinflation. Their debts go away. The people's savings go away. Um, so anyway, I see that, and I said years ago, I said I'm not predicting hyperinflation in in America anytime you know soon. But any nation that um, you know monetizes debt and just prints money runs runs a risk. And and Americans are like um, they think we're you know. It, Jerome Powell is not any smarter than Rudolf Havenstein was. You know, these are very bright German. These are smart German guys a hundred years ago. And uh, so what um, I've just, it's a risk. And I think we see it's only gotten worse in my 11 years. Clearly I'm, I'm not making much of a difference, you know, uh, never had a Congress. I, I always, you know, CC uh, or very often CC Congress people and stuff on when I'm pointing out what I think are simply egregious things. I've never once had a response um, not that I really expect it on Twitter, but um, I, I think our Congress, you know, it's it's just it's just a mess. So anyway, why Rudy? Because I I want to highlight that particular period because I think we're heading that way, and uh, not tomorrow. You know, I tell people I still accept dollars. You know, and um, but uh, yeah, I thought that was a a, a parallel that I want to try and get people to think about and try to avoid. But like I said, the, we keep electing the same people and and. And the Fed just gets worse and worse. I mean, Powell went insane, you know, uh, during COVID and uh, and before COVID too in 2019. So, and then of course Bernanke went insane, and then 
you know, 10 years of, we're paying for 10 years of ZERP. I mean, Jim Grant has a great quote that uh, the reason 5% rates are a problem is because of all the, the decade of 0% rates, you know, all the nonsense that went on and still goes on. So anyway, that's why I picked Rudy. Love it. It's uh, brilliant. The irony in that. And it's a warning. Said, I want to warn people, you know, absolutely. There's no and free lunch. There is no free lunch. And, you know, it goes back to Adam Smith and, you know, and people forget their history. And I love how you mentioned that. I always talk about this with other economists, that it's the reaction to ZERP that causes the hardship. You know, 5% rates aren't historically that high. You no, know, three, four, they're not. Um, but in comparison, it's always everything's relative. In comparison to the recent past, it is. And, you know, banks have unrealized losses. We have all mm -hmm. those other issues. And uh, so excellent point there. So I want to start with your background. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the economics and everything and finance, tell us about your background, what you like to share with us, uh, because sure. you certainly know quite a bit about economics and finance. Mm. Well, I thank you. I, I grew up... Um... I, I just call it very middle class. Uh, dad was a teacher. Mom took care of the kids, um, had a house, had one car, had a black and white TV, you know, like a lot of Americans growing up. Um, and uh, so I and I was around for the inflation of the 60s and 70s and, and saw what it did to my family, you know, and uh, how difficult it was uh, for my parents. And uh, so. I always had a job since I was like fifth or sixth grade delivering papers, you know, and then later on, you know, worked at box boy liquor store, all that kind of stuff. Um, my parents never owned any stocks as far as I know. Um, they never mentioned it, nothing financial, everything I know I learned on my own. Um, my dad had this shed that his, his father built in our backyard that was full of books. My dad was a, history major his historian history major yeah and he would um so it was full of books and they were all like nonfiction, you know and so i would be out there at a young age reading like um you know a college history book or something you know or um you know that sort of thing so i was always reading and i guess somehow i got uh i got a, I, I was always working so i had a little bit of money never took any money from my parents after you know grade school um and uh i just for some reason got interested in the stock market and you know, was investing in, in money market funds back in probably 1979 or at 14%, you know, returns. And uh, I was investing in stocks and learning the ropes back when I was, you know, a teenager, you know, eight, maybe I had to be 18, but uh, it was very early on and uh, I liked it. And, um, you know, I should be a billionaire today because I could have bought, you know, Amazon all day long or Microsoft, um, you know, uh, but as uh, Tommy Thornton, you, your guest the other day, I really enjoyed listening to him. He's a great guy. Um, you know, people forget that for every Amazon and Microsoft, you know, there's, there's 500, you know, CMGIs or, or he'd mentioned JDSU, which actually I think still survived under a, under a different name, but that, that chart, which I have somewhere on my Twitter is ridiculous. It's like straight up and straight down. And then we see it today. Um, Intel's getting hammered, right? So it's like 30 bucks or something. No, 20, 24 years ago, it was at like 60 or 70. I mean, it's lower than it was, you know, 25 years, 24 years ago, back in 2000. Um, a lot of what Tommy Thornton was talking about, I, I, I remember, you know, a Nortel. You know, I knew a guy that got wiped out in Nortel. Um, uh, you know, people forget there's survivor bias in the in the in mm -hmm. the indices and in everything because so many companies go away. I mean, there were, you know hundreds and hundreds of dot com, of dot com era companies that just went away so anyway uh, i was probably buying those back then so you know you learn your lessons when you're young and um and you know as tommy pointed out you know amazon had several 90 percent drops so i i like to say the only person that still owns amazon from you know the ipo days is was been in a coma this entire time because i'm sure you know most people would have sold out long ago um so yeah, I just started, uh, and I started reading and following people, and um, you know, I, I I always try and um, uh, listen to different people, um, and I find that uh, 
I, I guess I'd more of a Austrian view of the world, although I don't consider myself any sort of economist. Uh, I make fun. I'm sorry. You're, you said, told me you're an economist. I don't, I make fun of economists all the time, uh, but when I make, not you, not, not, the, not the cool economists. I've got a couple econ PhDs that follow me even they're cool, but um, it's the guys like, you know, the Krugmans of the world and the Wolfers and the, and the Furmans and the Summers and, you know, just, that crowd uh, who somehow has been given all this power by our society, these academic econ economists who, you know, basically are, are wrong all the time. And lately, you know, it's been um, what I call like a, the gaslighting, you know, uh, economy or media. I mean, you got uh, Greg Ip coming out the other day with, um, oh, uh, the data is not wrong. You're wrong. You know, and uh, or uh, Jonathan Chait saying, uh, you know, what was his line? Paul Krugman is right and you're wrong on the economy. You know, that kind of crap. So um, anyway, I, I've been trading for my own account uh, for, you know, since the 80s. And I started paying attention really in the 90s. Um, I've mentioned Bill Fleckenstein before. He was influential in the 90s, getting me interested in the Federal Reserve. And, uh, you know, I remember the dot-com bubble quite well. And I remember... The 2008 bubble quite well, and uh, and I remember this bubble quite well. Although it's it's ongoing, and um, and I'm not a bear. I own I'm bulled up. You know, I I've, I've never I haven't shorted since 2009. So my last shorts I had uh, Indy Mac and Downey Savings. That was that was it. And um, so I I'm I, I tell people I'm bearish in in theory, but not in practice. So I uh, you know. Um, yeah, just managed to survive all these years and uh, make a little money. And I never own any of the popular stuff that they talk about on TV. I mean, I really, I just own weird stuff and it's very undiversified portfolio and strange, but um, it's somehow it's worked for me. So I just have fun commenting on it too. Uh, as far as knowledge about, I just soak in, you know, all this people I've been watching over the years. I really find it fascinating for some reason. I don't know where it came from, but um, I love the markets. It's kind of like a casino. Although I say the casinos have are, are better regulated. <laughs> anyway. I love it. Thank yeah. you so much. That's excellent insights there. Um, I definitely want to talk about the markets and your thoughts on that. And, you sure. know, the best way to learn is through experience. You're an autodidact. You've learned and you're passionate. And that's yeah. the best. And you keep learning. And that's how I always say it's a journey of learning. We're learning every day. And, you know, there was an economist I had on here, Peter St. Ange. And yeah. he was amazing. And yeah, I like that. Um, yeah. Yes, exactly. So um, he was as another, he's another economist, an Austrian. So he's someone that I, I really admire. Um, but I would say I'm not an economist. I have an economics background, or maybe I'm a reformed economist. Well, I won't hold that against you. Yeah. <laughs> but I tend to follow the Austrians as well as the monetarists. And those are very different fields. But, right. you know, a blend, we create our own blend through our own lens of the world. But you made some excellent points there. How um, are they, is the media gaslighting the public? And there's that headline that just struck at me. What's, what's wrong with the economy? It's you, not the data. And that's very concerning because I think most people believe that, you know, yeah. and, you know, it. I believe the data is calculated to fit their narratives. That's exactly right. That's, uh, that's it. A hundred percent. They, um, I mean, I've been saying this for 11 years, but I pointed out the other day that I've got the, the point of the PCE and the CPI and everything else, the entire point is to understate reality mm -hmm. and and the reason is the incentives the government you know that look at the social security cost of living if you know if they used a real uh inflation number for for that the cola i mean if, forget the interest the government will be bankrupt off of that so they have a massive incentive to, to uh, downplay the cost of living and and i and then you hear these goofballs with like oh sticky sticky pce core x you know food x energy x you know whatever's going up and i and i and i and yet those figures are cited every day and they're used to calculate other things like what's real gdp you know uh if if cpi is understated then is is real gdp negative i mean you say that people are like freaking out but you know i'm of the opinion that half this country has been in a, a depression since 2008 2009 uh that the other thing about the gaslighting economy is 
they can point to the um to the restaurants that are full and that's true because oh, many of them are not a lot of them i mean but the the higher end ones are and it's because some people in this country are doing great um as i mentioned to you i i, I own stocks i've benefited from the insanity of the federal reserve i just think these last this couple decades really has been really bad for american society as a whole and so i'd rather have less money and live in a society that isn't insane you know and i get all the time on into it not all the time but sometimes hey i don't so the system's corrupt i don't care i'm making money and you know and people i like have that attitude too a lot of traders do hey screw it i'm just gonna make money and i understand that i'm making money you know i i, I try to make money i don't want to lose money i'm just saying that um you're getting this stratified sort of third world type country where you've got a decent number of fabulously wealthy people and then you've got a massive number of you know very poor or very hurting people and then to see these guys like greg ip or uh jonathan chait uh or krugman kind of just constantly downplay the cost of living like what are you what are you guys complaining about you know everything's great i mean the headline you're, you mentioned by greg ip what's wrong with the economy it's you not the data you know that i mean why not just spit in the middle classes and the poor people's face you know um, this guy is mentioned in Bernanke's book, you know, the courage to act in my own best interest. Um, he's listed Bernanke lists several reporters and he calls them like, you know, our special reporters that we get our message to and that we, um, uh, then they can, they, they can sp spread it out to the rest of the media. And it's one of those guys mentioned and they're, they're, they're propagandists. They're not journalists. Um, Tim, Tim Aros is, is another one, um, Hilson Rath, you know, I used to call him uh, Yellen's grandson. Uh, all these guys, Gina, all, all the ones, they're all, um, you know, Leesman has got to be the worst. He's a complete shill for the Fed every day. And unfortunately, I I will have CNBC on in the background of my think or swim out, but um, it's propaganda. So we have to we have to recognize that anything that Greg Ip or or Steve Leesman says is not news and it's not anything other than federal reserve propaganda these guys are the conduits that powell and brainerd are getting their message out through so uh once you recognize that you know you realize this you know just turn it off and and the other thing is everybody citing cpi well it's nonsense i mean you know the example i use is that the bls told us for 25 years that car prices didn't go up at all and and it's insane, right? But people, but people don't understand that what they started doing about, I don't know, 30 years ago was the hedonic quality adjustments, they call it. So what it means is your car goes up $10,000, but it's got these airbags and this new suspension or whatever that they calculate somehow is worth $15,000. So the car actually went down $5,000 in price. I mean, that's the kind of thing they do. There's another example I, I set out where they calculate through some elaborate math formula the, the hedonic quality adjustments of like a cotton shirt versus polyester or short sleeve versus long sleeve okay these guys are math phds at the bls and they they come up with these numbers that are nonsense to anybody in the real world you know you you don't pay the hedonically adjusted prices you pay them you pay the nominal price and uh and and these guys, they it's like they're spitting in our face. But I think, you know, who does Greg Gip go to lunch with? Does he go to lunch with a poor person? No. You know, so he's hanging out with, you know, Berde with the Berdanke or Powell or somebody. So um, very irritating. Bugs the heck out of me. Most people don't even know about any of this stuff. So, you know, if I can, you know, we're reaching, you know, 1% of the population that's interested in this. Most people are too busy trying to survive to worry about the Fed and what's going on and inflation which I think is is killing people. But, you know, Krugman says everything's fine. So <laughs> thank you so much for your focus and your mission to enlighten people. And that's the, the purpose of the show is to expose the realities of what's really going on. And, you know, excellent points there. And I do believe they 
find their own way to calculate it behind closed doors. And, you know, even CPI, for example, it underestimates the true inflation. And a good friend of mine, excellent economist, Daniel Lacalle from Spain. Oh, yeah. yeah, he's been on here three times and comes back quarterly or more. Uh, yeah. And we talk about this. And he talks about the shadow inflation, which is an alternative way of calculating inflation because they changed the way they calculated it. And uh, if you actually look at it, it, it should be more than double what the current CPI print is. And because um, they've given more value or less value to the daily consumables or whatever way they're trying to make it underestimated, like you said. And um, so, you know, the GDP as well is another thing you mentioned GDP. I want to just say, if you take out the massive government spending, the fiscal spending, which is bloating the GDP, you would see that it's actually disguising the private sector hardship. It's crowding out the public, the private sector. And sure. you know, and then you look at GDI compared to GDP, and the economy is stagnant. And I like how you say that we've been in because you you come out and you you say the truth, and you're like, we've actually been in a depression. And it's it's been a really dire since. 2009. It's not been this massive growth that we've been told that we've had. Um, so I'd like you to tell us more. You, you lived through this time period. You're an investor during this time period. How are you seeing things since 2009 until now with all this calculated data? And what are you experiencing and what's really been going on and how have they hoodwinked the public? Well, I mean, I, I think it was one of the um, Horizon Kinetics guys, Steve Bregman or somebody, those guys are great, uh, who who had a chart that I posted of um, of uh, CPI since uh, 20, 2007, which was running, I think he had it at 2.4%, and um, uh, M, I think he did M2, uh, and it was 6.6%. .6 and I said, what do you guys think is closer to your actual average annual rise in your cost of living since 2007. Do you think it's 2.4% like the CPI says, or do you think it's 6.6%? You know, and I, you know, everybody like, well, it's, it's people replying 10%, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think it's it, I, probably that's probably correct. I just think 6.6 .6 is much closer. In other words, the CPI is nonsense. And I think one takeaway from this interview, from my 40 plus years of you know, trying to find the truth. CPI is nonsense. PCE is nonsense. So you know what your cost of living is going up. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my my auto insurance. You know, just a, yeah, I know anecdotes are not data. Although actually, uh, Bezos has a great quote where he says, you know, if the data is different than the anecdotes, you know, I tend to think the data maybe they're not looking at it the right way. Maybe the he he sides with the anecdotes. You know, uh, all these things are I've tweeted out before, but. Um, uh, I, I think uh, people know that they're, you know, that, you know, they said food at home over the last year, BLS just came out recently, 1.2%. I mean, I just, I mean, you, you look at that and, they, and I, I made a joke like, oh, somebody presumably wrote this with a straight face at the BLS. It's complete nonsense. Um, and to anybody, I mean, like I said, I'm not the one that has to turn off my replies. You know what I mean? Paul Krugman had a turn off. He just did it recently. I joked that I felt like I was making a difference where you can only reply if um, if if Paul follows you or mentions you. So in other words, I, I always say that's the biggest sign of a fraud on Twitter is if somebody limits who can reply to them. So Krugman just started doing that uh, probably because he was getting so much hate, you know, about his, oh, everything's wonderful. What are you complaining about? And then uh, another one that was amusing was Claudia Somm is another one that's like everything's great you know now she followed me for years which i could not understand because i basically think everything about her profession is just garbage but uh i always left her alone and and um we never really got into it and when she would say something dumb i did not comment on it like i would if it was yelling or bernanke or something and then i just found you know i noticed mike green said she blocked him and i che and i checked and would, wouldn't you know it i just got blocked too and she was another one that turned off replies because before she blocked me because um and i wasn't replying to her but so many people were like saying are you nuts my cost of living is going through the roof you know I, these people are in an ivory tower they're really out of touch and the problem is we've given them you know goolsby's another one we've given them so much power why why is a failed regulator slash um 
Berkeley econ professor, our treasury secretary. Her track record, um, well, her track record for Larry Fink is, and you know, those guys has been great. But for the average American, it is not. She's a, she's a serial disaster. She's been at the Fed off and on since 1977. That's when she first appeared there. So we keep having the same people, you know, and uh, we're getting the same results, which is massive uh, increase in wealth inequality. By the way, here's another thing. I used to post the top 1% uh, a share of wealth. It was, I was using a, uh, it was either a BLS or a Federal Reserve uh, data series off of Fred. And uh, it looked ridiculous because the middle class is going down and the poor are staying flat and um, the top 1% is going to the moon. And they revised how they calculated that uh, last year. And so now suddenly they massively revised it so that it doesn't look nearly as bad. And it still looks bad, but not nearly as bad. And they, and they of course, go back and they reset all the all the data in the chart. So it, they do stuff like that. I mean, my biggest expense is health insurance. So I have a PPO, right? Um, and it they don't calculate health insurance. They, they In fact, they had some adjustment to their goofy way of doing health insurance. Um, was it late last year where they it fell like 34% year over year or something? Everybody was making fun of it. It's a total joke. Um, so my biggest expense, you know, um, is health insurance. And mine goes up every year on average about 15, 10, 15 percent. Mm -hmm. um, but this year it went up 7 percent. But that's still my biggest expense. And um, my auto insurance was 41 percent. And like I said, when I no no one's yelling at me, you're 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 full of it. I get all these other people saying, oh, my God, mine was 50 or mine was 30 or mine was 20. You know, it's all many multiples of what they say the actual, what the BLS says the, the price increases are. So um, I think that, again, I, it's almost like I want to just give up on trying to make this point because it's it's absurd. I, I, the, the CPI and PCA are nonsense. And um, so many people treat them as religion. And, and if you just stop doing that and just recognize that you're being lied to, and accept that and move on. I mean, I need to do that, you know, I mean, but I'm trying to inform people because so many people don't don't know, you know, anything. You know, that's why I started doing emails to friends years ago is because I'd mentioned something, you know, oh, my God, Greenspan did this or something. And they're like, huh? You know, who's who's what is Greenspan? Is he like in the Congress? Or no, he's the head of the Fed. It's 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 hard. And these are people that are very busy trying to survive. They're either trying to survive with their two jobs or whatever, or their business, small businessmen trying to run a company, you know, and, uh, but talk to any of those guys about the cost of living, you know, talk to you, you know, I, I, you know, but so it's insane to me that these guys, they must sit around, you know, Greg Ipp and Steve Leesman and, you know, and Jay Powell sit around with Nick Timoros and, and they, they say, Hey, everything's great, right? Look at CPI. It's like 3.5%. By the way. Okay. <laughs> I told you I'd go off on rents. Um, this 2% target thing is another thing that drives me insane. There is no 2% target. The Fed's mandate, legal mandate, is stable stable prices. Uh, they pulled this out of the uh, air, or I'll say to be polite, um, from some New Zealand central banker years ago, said, hey, what about 2%? And then Powell, I have a, again, this is all out there. It's over 30, 11 mm -hmm. years. Uh, Powell um, uh, explaining to Congress why the 2% rate. And it's really funny to watch because he basically is like saying, well, other people do it, you know. Um, he's basically saying we're going to officially steal 2% from you every every year. Um, and I think it's really many multiples of that higher. Bernanke said inflation's a tax. And he told Ron Paul when inflation was around 2% that it was too high. It was like 2.4%. And he said too high. And that was in 2010. Um, Bernanke said in, uh, I think around maybe 2012, he said, we're not going to allow CPI to go above 2%. We could raise rates in 15 minutes, you know? And, and so they did raise rates, but, uh, in fact, they raised them more than I, I thought they would have, but, um, uh, it's not really doing anything. And uh, there's some argument about whether the rates work or not, but I mean, mm -hmm. when you pump trillions into the economy <clears throat> and like you brought up with the government, you're spending a trillion dollars. Well, you're spending, I think, ten billion dollars a day, mm -hmm. the government. A uh, billion dollars used to be a lot of money, you know. And three, three trillion a deficit a year, or three and a half trillion—that's a lot of money. And people just throw these numbers out like they have no concept of how big these numbers are. Um, anyway, it's—I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know where I'm, where I started, where I'm going, but I love I, I've it. thought about this a lot. <clears throat> Excellent points. You know, the Fed, you know, many economists say the Fed doesn't have the tools to lower inflation because inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. You know, when they increased the money supply by, I think, over five trillion during COVID, I mean, what, what do you expect? And, yep. you know, there's an Austrian economist, I actually had written a paper about him, Murray Rothbard, back years yeah. ago, and he had said only increases in supply of fiduciary media, media you know, uh, money that's not backed by gold or silver, fiat, right. Um, right. <clears throat> can cause inflation, which is a redistribution of income and wealth, like you just said, yep. that runs counter to the market process. So when we have that, when we realize that, we're like, okay, so inflation is entrenched. And then we look at our day-to-day -day lives. And like you said, health insurance, car insurance, I'm experiencing the same. And then there's a chart on Fred, which is right there in plain sight for everyone to see. It's simple. Look at the purchasing power. And if you pull up that chart, you see a steady, like a cascade effect, the declining purchasing power, right? And I can't believe they still publish that chart. Right? <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, yeah they discontinued great. the M3 charts for I good know. reason. Yeah. And they don't want us calculating with that, but they kept that chart up. Watch them take it down now. But, yeah. you know, it's, um, that's, it's pretty in, in plain sight right there. So we yep. see the declining purchasing power of the dollar, which is the most important. You know, you throw out all that inflation CPI data, those numbers that are just, that I think, and I hate to say, it, here I go, I'm going to say made up numbers. They just calculate yeah. themselves. And just look at what you spend day to day and look at the declining purchasing power of the dollar. And it's clear in clear sight right there. So let's talk about the debt. Yep. Massive fiscal spending. It's an era of fiscal dominance. Over 34 trillion, over a trillion interest expense yearly. They spend in the boom time because they think it's time to borrow and boom. Then they spend during the recession because you have to save the economy. They're spending to no end. And it's unsustainable. Well, it's been said it's unsustainable. People think it's going to end tomorrow, but it does go on much longer than one thinks. So I'm going to have to ask you, what do you think? How much further can they kick the can down the road? Well, America has this, uh, you know, special privilege being the reserve currency. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think uh, we would have this issue would have come to a head many years ago. Um, you know, I've, I could find books from the 70s about the death of the dollar. Um, whereas if you look today, the dollars at uh, I don't know it's what the index 105, but yeah. um, Dixie, it's, yeah. it's 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 holding up well. Uh, but but as I, I like to phrase it, you know, I'm a really good basketball player if I play against, you know, five year olds, you know, mm -hmm. so the, the dollar index is against the euro, uh, which is, you know, I think that's got issues that the, the, the mm -hmm. yen, oh, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at the yen, I mean, or and the the pound and I think the Krona is in there, too. And mm -hmm. um, it, it, so it's it's like. Yeah, compared to the yeah, I mean that's the point. No one is on gold anymore. And Swiss used to be where they were the last holdouts. I think no, there's no backing for any currency anywhere uh, by anything other than just the, the confidence in the central bankers. So compared to um, the rest of the world, would you rather be in dollars than yuan or or euros? Of course, you know. And I, I like Brent Johnson, uh, his work, and uh, I think he's. Uh, you know, I like I say, I take I, I accept dollars. I, I don't think the dollar is going to collapse until, you know, at some point, um, you know, and uh, I don't know if if somehow it become it does. It's not the reserve currency anymore, uh, but that takes, you know, decades and decades and decades. So um, we're still only uh, what are we 50 years into this experiment um, of of fiat money. Um, and so many charts go off the rails after the early 70s. I mean, we, inflation wasn't even an issue. There's no, I think we did a Google search for um, Google, um, we searched books for certain words. And like before 1971, you do not see the phrase adjusted for inflation, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, it's a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, it used to appear in the old days, you know, you know, they found a new gold discovery or something, you know, and the prices would go up, but um, it's now a permanent fixture. Uh, and like I, I put a chart of PCE out the other day. I mean, if you 
uh, you know, a semi-log chart of it, it's 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 straight up and to the right. You know, it's like a Bitcoin chart, um, only without the without the drops. You know, inflation always goes up. Um, you know, Bookfar, Peter Bookfar is a great guy. I had a great oh, comment years he's ago. He's on the show twice. Yeah, he's great. But he had it he five years ago or something. He says when they were talking, remember the Fed for years was saying we need more inflation. We need more inflation. I would hear that every day until mm -hmm. like 2021. And uh, he says, you know, what are you guys talking about? There's always inflation. We, there's never no inflation. You know, it's always, we're just talking about how fast it's going up, you know. And so now the buzzword has been for months and months, disinflation, you know, um, it, which is funny because it's like, but your prices are still going up, right? You know, and people have to live on price levels, not rate of change. That's another thing. But as for the debt, um, you know, I've never been a band. I don't really focus on that. Although now it's getting, it's become so egregious that you really can't ignore it. Um, that's why they want inflation. Mm -hmm. They they want to massively inflate away the debt. Uh, they it's a it's they say well although we're, we're not going to default. Well, inflation is a default. It's a very regressive default. It's the it's it's the it's it's absolutely a default. Um, just like as if we said, hey, you know what, we, we, we're cutting your Social Security in half. People would be outraged, right? Oh, my God, you can't do that. That's outrageous. What do you? Yeah. Well, they never get elected, right? But what they can do is if they want to get inflation high enough so that the purchasing power of your Social Security gets cut in half, very few people will, uh, you know, notice that right away. They're, they're, we're all frogs, you know, boiling slowly in the pot. And so well, that, that's another pet peeve is when people say, oh, you know, we, we can't, there's only one option. We have to inflate our way out. Usually these are very wealthy people saying this, um, and, you know, and as if that's not a default, it absolutely is a default. Uh, you're going to get your, you're going to get your pension, but it's going to buy half as much as it used to. And so I think people are finding that now. I was just watching a video on um, homeowners insurance in Florida, you know, and it's like, oh my God, a little, a little house, you know, could be could be thirty thousand dollars or forty thousand, or if it's insurable at all. I mean, my my um, homeowners went up big last year. Like, I don't know what the percentage was. It was double digit, and I had to. I basically was able to cut it back down by uh, raising my deductible. But um, I hear these stories all the time, and we're not talking about one, you know, two percent increases or three and a half percent, which is the current, uh, I think, CPI rate. We're talking double digits. Uh, in mo over multiple years too sometimes. And that's if you can get some of these products, any insurance at all anymore. So uh, the debt is going to be a problem at some point. And all we've done this generation is kick the can. And we're very, they're very good at kicking the can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I really view this generation, uh, particularly the last, since we went off gold basically, but as you know, it's like a, your grandparents, you're taking your whole family out to dinner at a fancy restaurant. And then, you know, you run up this massive bill and then the grandparents sneak out and don't pay and leave the kids with the bill. That's exactly what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wrong. And I think that this is a very, um, you know, the worship of, of ephemeral wealth in this country bothers me on a moral level. Um, you know, we idolize the rich. Um, Adam Smith has a great quote on that uh, somewhere I could dig up. But it, it's, it's not right. There's a lot of people. I mean, look at any major city. You've got mile. You've got tent cities. You've got miles of of homeless people. Fentanyl, you know. You've got crime. You know they'll they'll tell you, oh, the crime's going down. People don't report crimes anymore. I know people that don't report crimes because they're like, what are the police going to do? They're going to show up and go, ah, we can't do anything. I've seen it. You know, so so crime and yet and so people feel really um, down and and then we send a hundred billion dollars more to Ukraine or Israel or whoever. You know. And I think people feel right now, other than, you know, the Larry Finks and Steve Schwartzman, those guys there, they feel very, um, very taken care of by this country. But I think so many people don't, you know, uh, feel taken. I, they feel like the country is actively <laughs> opposing them, you know, and trying to trying to hurt them. And uh, especially when you see guys saying, hey, let's let's raise the inflation target. I mean, not that the poor people are paying attention to CNBC, but what they're really saying is we want to screw you to to help. The stock market go up, which like a very small percentage of the population owns an overwhelming amount of the wealth in the stock market. For most people, for half of America, I don't think they own any stocks at all. Okay, so this this worship of the stock market as the number one uh, most important thing on earth, which is basically how I think they've run the, the last 
20 years is it's wrong. It's bad. It's bad. You know, it's going to, you know, you don't want to end up with, you know, Honduran levels of wealth inequality or whatever. No offense to Honduras. Um, anyway, that's another soapbox, but the debt, it's going to be an issue someday. Let's have the grandkids worry about it. Yeah. Or the great grandkids. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 that seems them. to be yeah. it. I know. Hey, I'm, it. I'm making money. What do I care right? about the future? Jeez. It's, it's, it's discouraging. It is. It's morally wrong. And uh, I agree with yeah. you. You know, they want to inflate away the debt. And I know I like that point you made about, you know, they say, oh, crime is down. It's just because <laughs> less people are reporting it, you know, yeah. and yeah. so it's uh, don't trust what you read or the, da the data and the headlines, especially. So, yeah, there's a redistribution of wealth going on. I mean, ZERP, the easy money policy that we had skyrocketed the wealth and the net worth of the wealthiest. And, you know, yep. this, yeah, the Cantillon effect. And that system rewarded the borrowers, not the savers. We know fiat is built on debt and mm -hmm. it's a debt system. It's only backed by the government guarantee. I guess that means a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, well, you know, global reserve currency is key. Excellent point you made there as well. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the Fed. We got to talk about this Fed. And, you know, you had <laughs> some great, about the Fed. Yeah. right? You had some great tweets recently about Ben Bernanke and you mentioned yeah. him and you said um, about this 2008, you had murderers row and, you know, oh, um, yeah. and Yellen is complicit as well. She's monetizing oh, yeah. the debt through bills. Um, they're neo Kisnesians, group think. Um, yeah. And, you know, are they inept or are they just disinformation specialists? Uh, do they um, are they really well, making policy error after error, or are they intentionally providing misinformation? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And should we abolish the Fed and the Fed? <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Janet Yellen it was head of the Federal Reserve, um, and then when she left, uh, and the, the head of the Federal Reserve is probably the top bank regulator in the country, right? So then she left, and over the next two years, which we found this out because of her uh, Treasury um, Secretary financial disclosure, she, the next two years, she made $7.2 million just in giving speeches, mostly Zoom calls, because this was during COVID, um, to the same banks that she was in charge of regulating the year before. So I consider that to be a delayed bribe, in my opinion. Um, for past and future services. Uh, we're talking Citadel, we're talking Citibank, we're talking BlackRock. Um, I think that's corruption at the highest level. And it's not just her, you know, it's uh, as we, I mean, I cannot believe that Bernanke, the previous head of the Federal Reserve, went to Citadel and PIMCO. They all go to PIMCO. And Someone told me he's making 20 million a year. I don't know. But to me, that is like uh, beyond egregious. I cannot believe that it, nobody cares. Congress doesn't care. Congress, you know, they're talking uh, some news item today about, you know, oh, Trump wants to take more control of the Fed or something. You know, Congress is in charge of the Congress created the Fed and, uh, and Congress could put a leash on it at any time, but they don't because the Fed is like the drug dealer for Congress, you know, mm -hmm. um, and Congress is very corrupt, as we've seen. They they do not care what the public thinks, as we can see from some of their recent you know, votes, you know, um, they don't. And it's bipartisan. I've uh, I tell people, get out of the D versus R trap. It's a it's a dead end. Um, they're both awful uh, in different ways. You know, they they primarily try to push people's buttons on um you know, cultural issues, but they're both horrible. They're run by horrible people. There might be good people here and there, but um, uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's just um, Congress and the Fed enable each other. Uh, Congress could, could end the Fed. Uh, I mean, I'm not delusional. I don't, I don't expect the Fed to be ended, but I love to joke about it. Um, mm -hmm. We survived without the Fed. The Fed is, I call it for years, a private bank cartel, you know, um, they look, look at, look at where they all go to. I, I, I mean, I've provide, I've got the receipts, as I say, I've provided all this evidence. Look at, they all go to, um, PIMCO. I mean, Kashgari went to PIMCO, Greenspan went to PIMCO, Bernanke went to PIMCO. Uh, gosh, was it Clarita that was years at PIMCO? 
Um, that's just one example. They go look at Stan Fisher, who was a very powerful guy, former vice chair. Uh, he went to um, BlackRock, you know, and mm -hmm. and Bernanke's at Citadel. And I bet you in 2020, when, uh, you know, markets were falling and Ken Griffin was probably sweating bullets. And I bet Ben Bernanke was on the phone talking, you know, to Powell and to Congress. And uh, boy, those guys, when they when a billionaire uh, is in trouble financially, boy, they get response, don't they? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I joked uh, in twenty March 2020, some of my best stuff was in March 2020 because I saw it was happening. You know, I said, if you miss 2008, turn on the TV, you know, and uh, all the bankers are at the White House, you know, uh, they're all got their hand out. And you've got all these guys that, you know, are never on Twitter or suddenly they're uh, saying we need to do, you know, that got me blocked by Cliff Afsnes, by the way, because I he wrote an editorial and you know, and the headline was like, libertarian says we all need a bailout or something. And I said, libertarian, you know, or do you mean a hedge fund guy that's losing his ass right now? And uh, so that got me blocked. But I mean, I, 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 I these billionaires, you know, they, they got their hand out. So here's 2000 for you. And here's, you know, how many billions for these guys? I mean, I pointed out too that, and uh, Matt Taibbi was good on this years ago in 08. So I kind of, piggybacked on his stuff like all these programs they set up to give loans like matt like i'm talking i don't know if it was the towel for smmtp they had so many different programs but basically i was looking and i put it out there i published it uh these llcs that were formed in the cayman islands like two weeks before are getting like 120 million dollar loans at you know 0.75 percent interest or something and it's like who are all these people? I have a thread on this. Where I'm like, who is this? Who is this? And nobody, you know, the mainstream media, nobody picks it up. I mean, nobody cares. I shouldn't be the guy pointing this out. You know, uh, the corrupt, it was unbelievable. I mean, all these guys in Bermuda or all these, all these shell corporations are set up and they're getting hundreds of millions of dollars at no rate, uh, zero rates, and nobody cares. You know, it goes back to the, the reporters we have on this. I mean, look, look at the books that, um, the two top Wall Street Journal reporters, uh, Hilson Rath and, um, and Timoros, right? You know, they they glorify the Fed. You know, uh, the the, um, the these guys are not reporters. That's another thing to remember. Mm -hmm. Look at the look at the press conferences Powell has. You always have the exact same people, and they're picked by Powell's yeah. aide, oh, Michelle yes. Smith. <laughs> and Michelle Smith has been running the Fed basically for like decades. So look into Michelle Smith. There's very little out on her, but in my Twitter feed, there's a great article someone wrote about Michelle Smith. She basically is the most powerful person at the Fed, you know, ongoing. She, and she picks who gets invited and she picks who speaks at the press conference. And I've said for years, you know, have, why, why, why not have, um, you know, Jim Grant ask a question at the, at the Fed press conference? Be, it's because they don't want, it's not about question and answer it, or, or truth or news. It's about propaganda. The, these are hand-picked reporters, and if they don't toe the line, they won't be invited back. Now, what kind of thing is this? The Fed is like arguably one of the most powerful institutions in the United States for some reason, and there's never any questioning. And if they, if Powell goes on, you know, The View or something, or or any news, <laughs> CNN, they they can't they can't they they worship the guy. He's it's the most deferential reporters um, I've ever seen is when they're questioning Fed officials. They're, they're like they're talking to they think they're like Greek gods or something. And I don't understand it because these people have just horrific track records. And and yet they're they're treated with kid gloves by the entire financial media. I mean, there's nobody who who comes to mind. I mean, Jim Grant, maybe Ron Paul, um, you know, there's a handful, you know, Ed Chancellor or, or Jeremy Grantham. But there's no one in Congress going after the Fed anymore you used to have ron paul and sometimes bernie sanders but bernie has just gone completely awol he's he's they bought him out they paid him off mm -hmm. um but now there's nobody and the fed has carte blanche to do whatever they want you know i joke you know powell could you know say anything and the fed would would buy it i mean the, the congress would buy it so it's a very we don't have we need a more of an adversarial you know people criticize congress reporters go after congressmen and stuff all the time they don't go after the federal reserve um, and I just don't know why, because these guys' track record is horrific, I think. And and they're very powerful, very wealthy people who often leave their post and go work at some major mm -hmm. bank for millions of dollars. It's a revolving door. It's They don't work for us. Uh, well, I'll give one more example before I, and I'll be quiet. Um, the, 
uh, Powell, you know, recent press conference, maybe a year ago, he gets on there and he goes, you know what, people, someone asked him a question. He goes, you know what, people really hate inflation. They hate it. It's exact quote. They hate it. People hate inflation. They hate it. And I'm like yelling at the screen, dude, you guys specifically formulated a plan to spike inflation. You wanted higher inflation. You wanted higher inflation for 10 years. You weren't happy that it was 2% or 1.5%. And, and there's no accountability for these guys. Now, if you think about it, you know, we got up to 9% official inflation. So as even, I hate to quote Larry Summers, but he said it would have been, would have been 18% if they calculated it the old way. Well, that you, you financially hurt permanently several hundred million Americans through your actions, the Federal Reserve, people like Kashkari, people like Brainerd. Um, and there's no accountability for any of them. All the ones who said it was transitory. We're still, we're three years when they've been over their made up 2% target. Right, we're at three three and a half percent right now. So there's no accountability, and so the other thing is they they won't tell you that they've raised their target, but they're perfectly happy with three and a half percent. Look at the stock market today. It came out at you know PC came out on the whatever it is. Um, it's always up, but it's a nonsense number. I shouldn't quote it, but the stock market's up. They don't care, and that's actually a bull case for the stock market because if they're gonna you know keep the foot on the pedal and and just uh, allow uh, probably closer to six or eight or 10% real life infl inflation stocks are going to go up because stocks are claims on real assets, you know? Um, so don't know. I wouldn't own bonds. I, I've joked. I'd rather own Dogecoin than bonds, but um, anyway, just in summary, it would be nice to have some accountability. There is never any accountability and our media is abysmal on this. Um, our mainstream media and uh, again, it's a it's a big problem in this country. We need accountability, whether it's the warmongers, you know, who did Afghanistan and Iraq, no accountability there, or it's the guys that have created the greatest wealth inequality since the 1920s. Uh, no, no accountability. Yes. The values are out the window and no one's accountable for their actions. And it's like everyone sells out and gets bought out. Like you said, Bernie Sanders, it's like everyone just gets paid off and they take yep. their own piece and they, they don't care about the rest of the people. And, uh, and I always talk about the allegory of the cave and Plato and the, the shadows on the wall. And, you know, it's important for us to enlighten others. And, you know, we're part of, you know, we're all one in some way and we're, it's a collective consciousness and we're here to do good. You know, we're not just here to benefit for ourselves. We're here to help one another. You know, there's a greater purpose. And so um, I agree with you. Um, there has to be some accountability and we have to hold these people accountable. We can't glorify them like they're the God. And and we, you know, we listen to what they say. And, you know, the top don't pay taxes. And when they come out, they say, oh, we're going to tax the rich. It's uh, they're what rich? I mean, who? The middle class? The upper middle class, maybe? You know, they're not, you know, the, the Bezos of the world aren't paying taxes. And, you know, their corporations are in elsewhere, like you said. And so, you know, it's it's an unfortunate reality. Um, but, you know, the Fed exacerbates the boom and the bust, the, the different recessionary and inflationary cycles. The Austrians go so far as saying they're the ones that create these cycles in the economic cycle. Yes. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, there's a big talk about these rate cuts and you know, I think the market has detached from the macro. The market does what it wants. And, you know, inflation works both ways. I always tell people this, you know, it's it affects the bottom line, but it also affects the top number. They're higher prices. You know, it doesn't mean just because companies are reporting higher revenues doesn't mean they have higher volumes or right. higher quantities, <clears throat> yes. right? Yes, yes. And, you know, the consumer is reeling in. The consumer spending is down. The consumer's, you know, private debt is through the roof. People are, you know, it's really hard in making ends meet. So we have all those issues. So you know their pattern. You've been watching them closely for many years and their track record. What do you think this Fed does into this year? You really think they're going to cut rates with this strong economy on paper and the equities market running? It's kind of, it would be difficult right now for them to cut rates. I know they want, they really want to, of course. And of course, every billionaire is on TV you know, saying we need to cut rates and, and uh, we need a higher inflation target. But um, yeah, they, um, 
I'm surprised they got to five, really. I mean, remember in 2019 or 20, late 2018, they got to like two and a quarter and the market fell 15 plus percent or something. And the world was coming to an end. We actually had comparisons to 1931 in late 2019. So that I didn't think they had much stomach. Now, for them to get to five must mean that they were really scared of inflation. They must have really known that they screwed up on the transitory. And I had thought that Powell maybe got ticked off at his staff because he was going insane with them for a while on the, um, you know, he was he was the one that said, we, we want inflation to run higher. And, and this guy comes from the real world. He's not an academic economist. Well, he comes from a very rarefied real world. But I didn't think he would go as insane as he did on the uh, loose side, um, and I and I didn't expect him to hit five percent on the on the uh, tighter side. I think after they sort of panicked, I mean, for them to do those seventy five basis point hikes, you know, a while back, that that was uh, uh, surprising to me because uh, for the previous fifteen years they couldn't get above two percent without the world ending. So and the world didn't end, um, and uh, I think there's a lot of extend and pretend going on as always, you know. Um, you know, it's the old, uh, if you owe the bank $100, it's your problem. If you owe the bank $100 million, it's the bank's problem. Uh, there's a lot of that going on. Um, I don't, you know, frankly, I've never really said, you know, uh, I think Zerp's insane. But I but I don't know whether rates should be 5% or 4% or 6%. Neither does the Fed. But they pretend they do. Um, I'm actually always, I've been more focused on this uh, balance sheet, the quantitative easing, which, you um, Stan Druckenmiller says is the single biggest uh, ex uh, exacerbator of wealth inequality mm -hmm. in recent years. Um, I mean, that's still sitting, uh, oh, I don't know, what are they at, seven point something tr trillion or something? Anyway, it's up, you know, they went insane. The MBS purchases particularly bugged me. They bought about $2.7 trillion of mortgage backed securities um, in total, uh, maybe half of that uh, during COVID as house prices were going up 20% year over year, you know, so they, they've massively messed with, as if things weren't bad enough with the economy in general, they had, they really messed with the housing market. And now we have a situation where, you know, if you've been in your house for longer than five years, you couldn't afford it today. You know, um, there's, there, it's a huge problem. You're not getting family formation. Young people can't uh, uh, start families and buy homes because they're just so expensive. Um, you've got all these, you know, Austin has 15,000 Airbnbs that should be long-term either rentals or homes for people to live in. Um, that's a big problem. You've got the Black uh, Black Rocks. Um, well, actually, it's Blackstone, I think, is the one with the, you know, they own hundreds of thousands of, of single-family homes. This is all new since 2008. So we, this is a new housing market. we got the Fed juicing the mortgage market with the MBS purchases. Um not only are Fed funds rate back to basically 60 year averages, but so is the mortgage rates. I mean, the average, you know, my, my, uh, a lot of people have memory, my age have memories of, you know, 15% mortgage, you know, mortgages. Um, so seven and a half percent is outrageous compared to three, but it's really historically not aberrant. The problem is the houses are at what went way up, you know, what went through the roof. They are not at historical averages. So, you know, we've been sitting around for a year or two, like, you know, waiting for the, you know, Wiley Coyote off the cliff to fall. But uh, I think what we're seeing is very little low inventory. Uh, I'm in a weird area. So it's, 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 I don't, I, I, I think the rest of the country, there are areas that are having problems like Austin and, and uh, Boise and the, the places mm -hmm. that were hottest during COVID. But um, Anyway, it's it's it, I, the balance sheet matters more to me. I think they should they should lower that. And of course, they're not. I mean, they are, mm -hmm. but it's so slow. They were buying five. They bought five hundred billion dollars of MBS in like two months, you know, in twenty twenty. And now, you know, maybe they've, you know, they've they've lowered it by a bit over the over the last few years. But um, the rates, I don't care. I just think ZERP is horrible. I mean, mm -hmm. if they drop the rates to three percent or something, I mean, I'm not going to be yelling at them about that. Not that anyone cares what what I think, but. Um, the ZERP was a, was a, was Disaster. horrible because it encouraged mm -hmm. massive debt, yes. massive non-productive debt. As I like to say, where's our Hoover Dam? We don't, you know, so all this debt that we've added under Trump and Biden, where did it go? It went, it's like you set it on fire. There's no new interstate highway, you know, and that's another problem with our, with our era. It's all ephemeral. Um, there's a great Rick rule quote. Uh, my assets were ephemeral, but my debt was money good. So, you know what I mean? It, it, people say, oh, my house is, 
just to uh, go off on a tangent, like I warned you. Um, so like if you're in a neighborhood and there's, let's say there's 10 houses and they're all worth 500 grand. I mean, the last, you know, everyone thinks their house is worth 500 grand and then a house sells for 600 grand. Well, suddenly mentally in their head, everybody revalues their house at 600 grand, you know, and, but that works in reverse too. So what we have right now, at least where I'm at, we've got almost no inventory. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple houses that have been sitting at very, I think very over, of course, I think everything's overpriced, very overpriced levels. They've been sitting for months and months and months. And periodically they, they take the houses off the market and then they put them back on. So the listing says, oh, they've only been on for 10 days, but they're just sitting there. And I'm thinking once one of the, if one of these guys just says, you know what, I've made, I made plenty of money. I'm going to sell my house and I'm going to sell it for a hundred grand less than the last sale in the neighborhood. Cause I just want to get out, get out of here. Well, once that happens, everyone goes, wait a minute wait a minute, that, now my comp is 100,000 less than I had in my mind. You know, it's like, that's why I say that your assets are ephemeral. It's like, you may say I own a, I own a million dollars worth of, of uh, uh, Intel, but you know, now if you, if you said that yesterday, now you own what? You own $900,000 worth of Intel or 800,000, whatever, whatever it dropped today. So um, anyway, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the housing Excellent. market. It's a mess right now. And, it, and it's, points. it needs to go down. Prices need to drop. Yes, I was actually going right into the real estate market. So you you beat me to it. Oh, yeah. uh, I was going to go right into that area. You know, we talked quickly about the liquidity injections. I mean, the Fed, the Treasuries, and the BFTP, and the BTFP. Uh, I always reverse those numbers, but the the BTFP and you know, and like mortgage backed securities, like you said, they need to reduce that balance sheet. And the liquidity injections they did help you know mitigated some of the quantitative tightening they've been doing. Right. 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 Yeah. And Michael so, Michael Howell talks about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I I mean I talk about that. I read about that. There's some you know great discussions about that. It's important people know that. And you know I also believe it was policy mistake after policy mistake. ZERP was a total policy mistake and disaster for everyone and the conditioning on the people and everything and it affects yeah. all areas of our life money is everything money affects everything all of our decision making and i also live in a weird area i live on the gold coast of long island and yeah. um right outside the city not too far out and so i it's a little area here like a little enclave and historical low inventory there's like right in Same our here. area right there's only like one or two i think two homes on the market and it's crazy. It's never been like this. Yeah. And I think the Fed locked people into their homes, you know, with two and change percent interest rates. So why sell? You know, and you're going to go and exchange it for what, seven and a half percent, you know, and, you know, it's also the commercial real estate market affected by that, you know, the cap rates, the debt yields. You have so many issues when they come to refinance and they're sort of shorter term loans, they need to refinance. They're going to have to pull out more cash, a lot of defaults going on. And, you know, they don't talk about it enough. I met with a great commercial real estate guy from Manhattan and he's like, it's far worse than what they tell you. Right. And, and, you know, and we know that the real estate market is slow. It's yeah. a very slow moving process, but yes, home prices are still higher and compared to pre COVID, you know, inventory has increased a little bit now, but it's still much lower than it was before. And home right. prices are still elevated much more. So right. it's very concerning. So I want to know what you think. You, you went into it, which is great. But what do you think, based on your path, your experience with the real estate market, do you think that something's going to have to, like some catalyst is going to have to occur or people going to be losing their jobs, not being able to afford their mortgage, whether it's at 0%. Um, what can be the catalyst that's going to really accelerate that real estate market and bring those prices down? Uh, maybe time. You know, I mean, uh, people, like I just saw a commercial building uh, I was reading about that went into special servicing or basically it's going to go into foreclosure and they had a 2.75% rate. Um, so it's, it, if you're insolvent, you know, it probably doesn't matter what, what yeah. your, what your rate is. Um, the commercial is a complete, I, I'm just shaking my head. I think that um, there's no governmental incentive to, 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 um, or there's no of any site local or federal to publicize how bad it is in commercial. I mean, the loss severities are just, amazing not 80 90 percent in some cases um you know buildings selling for two dollar square foot or two dollar square foot or so it's it's buildings that are selling you know for less than they paid you know 
uh, 10 years ago. You know, um, there there's a lot going on in commercial. And I think there's also a lot of extend and pretend. Uh, the banks, you know, they don't want the keys back on, on the uh, on a uh, commercial office building. Um, so there's a lot of negotiating and and ex extend and pretend, which is basically, you know, the main uh, solution uh, we've we've tried for 20 years or 15 years. Um, in how the housing, I don't know, you know, um, so many people bought Airbnbs, um, oh, yeah. the vacation like, you know, rentals. <laughs> yeah. These short-term rentals. And it's not like, you know, some extra bedroom in grandma's house. You're talking entire houses, mm -hmm. which I call neighborhood motels. Yeah. But, um, that's an economic decision. You know, you're living in it. And I, and if you were getting two grand a, a week and now you're getting one grand and it doesn't mm -hmm. cover your expenses. Yeah. If it doesn't I think a lot of these flow. Yeah, I think a lot of these people are just going to say, you know what, it's a business decision, and this goes for the for the big guys that own a hundred thousand homes too. Um, the problem is when the big guys sell like Sternlicht or whatever, they sell to other big guys. You know, they don't sell to families that that want. You know, they they buy houses two thousand at a time and they sell them two thousand at a time. You know, instead of um, if they sold them one at a time, two thousand houses. Yeah, I think that would affect prices. I think maybe the uh, the, uh, the 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 house hacking garbage and the um, commercialization of, of uh you know all these airbnbs and short-term rentals if 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 you get a decent number of people um for whatever reason economic downturn or just you know nobody's going to the ozarks as much anymore or something you know they start selling that should lower prices um certainly if a big guy like sternlich gets into real trouble and has to dump uh but again it's going to be like you know blackrock will buy it off or blackstone mm -hmm. you know so um so that's not really encouraging. And that, that that's all new. That was all Tim Geithner and the Obama administration. They packaged up, you know, these houses by the hundreds or thousands and they and they sold them to, to their donors. And it's just a shame. And now uh, Geithner is now head of Warburg Pincus, by the way. So they all get their payday. They all get their delayed bribes, uh, in my opinion. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just think, I, I think it's psychological. Like I was trying to poorly phrase it that, you know, everyone has, based on the prior sales in their neighborhood, a mental picture of what mm -hmm. their house is worth. Now, they may have lived in the house for 30 years, but they've got they've got this, this you know, it's like checking your Z estimate every day, which people, some people do, <laughs> and and which is completely insane. But yeah. um, uh, I think that, like I said, I remember in 08, 09, in my neighborhood, there was a house that was listed for... I don't know, let's say uh, uh, $900,000. And then if they would have asked 850 or something or 890, they would have sold it. But then, then let's say it goes to a month later, they were at 850. A month later, they're at, they're at seven, they're at 800. Um, I think they, you know, they ended up selling for half of what they were originally asking for it because over time they were chasing the market down. I think when you see your, you think your house is worth 500 and your neighbor's is 500. And then you see your neighbor who has, for whatever reason, death, divorce, they have to sell. Uh, now they, it goes for $50,000 less for 50. Well, now you're thinking, well, hopefully that's an aberration, but then someone else sells for 450. Now, suddenly everybody in the neighborhood is mentally lowering their price. And that that's either uh, a, a restraint on, on their consumption maybe because they think they're less wealthy or maybe it's an incentive like i kind of want to move i better sell now before it goes to 800 or, or before it goes to 400 or 350 so i think that's that's what i saw last time um was kind of chasing the market down and then you get you know you have fomo on the way up and you can also get fomo on the way down mm -hmm. uh, same thing happens with stocks too you know i was looking the other day and you know uh, california uh, everyone thinks you know I mean, california's used to housing bubbles but they've had some busts um i was looking there was a bust from not, not like a phoenix type bus but a night from 1990 to 1996 i just looked at this yesterday uh, case shiller um in california fell 26 percent over six years and then they kind of stayed flat and then they went insane in the in the 2000, early 2000s. But um, California lost 26 houses on average, lost 26 percent. You know, in, it took six years. That's the other thing. People, you know, I think housing peaked last time in 2006 and uh, didn't bottom until 2012. So again, mm -hmm. like six years. So when do we think houses like maybe peaked here? You would say maybe 2022, early 2022 or something like that. Well, six years is 2028. 
Mm. You know, and um, so I could see it taking time. It's a battleship. Like you say, it's a big, it's a real estate is a uh, slow moving thing. Very slow. So, and I, I personally, you know, I never add the Z estimate on the way up and I don't subtract it on the way down. So psychologically, it doesn't bother me. I'm not going anywhere. Does my, you know, um, but I would like to see uh, kids able to buy houses and start families, you know, um, and not have, you know, a million dollar house now is 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 a is a is a is a shack i mean it's a it's not a shack but it's a it's a little ranch house with like mm -hmm. 1200 square feet and uh needs some work um it's a shame it's a shame i never when i grew up uh i never occurred to me that i wouldn't be able to afford a house because the ratio of the ink of the house price to the income was you know uh, I use apples to apples example of houses that I know of. I mean, in the in the '60s, it was three times one income, uh, three and a half times one income. In the in the '80s, it was three times two incomes, uh, for nice house. And then now, you know where I'm at. You know, the average house is well over a, a probably a million two or something. So, how many couples make four hundred grand? You know, or, or you know, I, I mean, it's basically like you know, I think California's. Median income is is something like medium household income is something like seventy five thousand. So you're talking like fifteen times income, you know. And when I grew up, it was like maybe five times your income or something. You maybe you were making uh, maybe you were making thirty grand, and mm -hmm. the house was uh, was was one hundred and ten, you know. And I'm in a very high cost of living area, but you could buy a house for one hundred ten thousand dollars. It was a very nice house within you know the last I guess this would have been like in the last forty years. But um, now that same house would be million and a half it's insane but nah. i'm not as i say i'm not dictator yet so i can't fix fix any of this I just <laughs> we'd like to fix it i think yeah. time takes time you know you mentioned peter book bar and he was on the show twice and he mentioned he had a great line that he said he said home prices now compared to the past are a greater percentage of someone's income and like you said um you know it's, right. it's 15 times versus five times and you know it's it's very dis disturbing and I feel bad for our children and you know the ones who want to purchase homes and it's like they're just going to have to take out more debt there's mm -hmm. no way they could buy a home or even think of owning a home without taking on a, a big portion of a debt and you know there goes the the whole money merry-go-round with the debt system and just creating more debt and minting more money and then you know 83 percent of the money is minted by debt by loans from the banks and so they just, just the whole debt system. And, you know, the Zillow, funny that you mentioned that, the Zillow, and I know I used to be in commercial real estate, I actually had my own brokerage years ago. And yeah. um, and I did some real estate and residential as well. And it's funny how they look at Zillow as the value of your home. Yeah. When, you know, how I always looked at it was it's where buyer and sellers meet. And that's right. the price. And then just like stocks, right? Follow right. price, they say. The technical analysts always say to follow price. And it's like price is what the stock is, is worth right now. Yeah, are there opportunities for the future? Absolutely. And there are inefficiencies, sure. But what someone's willing to buy and sell right now is the actual value right now. So the home, whether Zillow says five million, but someone's only willing to give you two and a half. I mean, is it really worth five million, or is it really exactly. worth two and a half? Right, so, it's a psychological phenomenon. A lot of yeah, ways, psychological. Right? So it takes time for that psychology to sink in. People are still exhibiting recency bias, and they're anchored to these prices, just like price targets with stocks. You and I are yeah. traders and investors. Yeah. We know how it works in the market. You're anchored. It's a it's a cognitive bias bias, and. Um, so we tend to attach. So I think that's what's going on in real estate as well. People are attached to these numbers. Right? There's no inventory or very huh? low. So they're attached to these high numbers and prices aren't coming down yet. And 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 it's just, you need those days in the market to increase. So I, I love listening to like some of these savvy real estate guys that have been around for more than, you know, 10 years. Um, th that's a common theme I've, I've heard and listening to different podcasts with some of these guys, uh, commercial particularly. Um, there's just this this chasm between the buyers and sellers. the The sellers are thinking of 2021 or 2022 prices, and the buyers are thinking of you know their vultures. They want to get the best deal they can. And and frankly, at some of these commercial properties, the deal doesn't make any sense unless you pay half of what you know the last sale was or something. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's definitely true. I'm sure it's it's also true in uh, 
in uh, residential. Um, yeah. uh, speaking of book far and, um, and uh, Tommy Thornton and all, I just want to throw in here. Um, the one of the best things about uh, being on Twitter is uh, just the, the guys that I've met that I never would have met Amazing. in a million years, you know, and, and uh, people like yourself. And, but I mean, yeah. I, I mean, all these guys that, that are household names in the FinTwit world, um, you know, some of them follow me, you know, and, and I follow them and it's like, I mean, I've had, con you know, Jim Grant sent me an email, you know, um, uh, it, to be able to contact guys like, you know, I got Tony Greer as a big trader. You think I'd be a better trader. I got Kevin Muir and I got Thornton and all that, but, um, and then so many great thinkers, you know, um, mostly related with the markets, but, uh, you know, Nassim Taleb follows me. I mean, what the heck is that all about? You oh, know? And, uh, he's awesome. I love yeah. him. The black swan. I love oh, his uh, anti-fragile. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I'm very proud. I, I mean, it's, I'm very humbled by by these guys because these are some of the guys that I was reading, like Bill Fleckenstein. You know, I was reading him, God, 30 plus years ago, you know, 30 years ago. And here he is. We we follow each other. And I, uh, Grant Williams, you know, he was my first podcast. And um, I just, anyway, I just, I can't name him because I'd leave off too many, but yeah, that's but been like- you know, Amazingly. people are sick of the BS. People are sick of being fed lies yeah. and they want to know the truth and what's really going on. And you do yeah. an excellent job. Oh, thank that. you. Oh, I try. I just try and speak, you know, and that, you're that so quote. funny. <laughs> well, it would be depressing if it, if it wasn't funny. That's why I like to joke because a lot of what I'm pointing out is, is not encouraging. So, but I don't want, I'm very happy. People like, Oh, you, you know, I, I'm very happy and I'm bullish. I mean, I'm, I own stocks, you know. And that's and... what I want to go into right now. We're going <laughs> okay. to get to the happy, positive side because, right. look, yeah. I've been an investor for so, what I've been doing this, entrepreneur investing 25 plus years. And, you know, I, you know, you learn through the hard times and you learn, you make your mistakes young and you learn from them. And I always learn that even through the hard times, there's always opportunities. There's always ways to not only survive, but thrive and grow. And so I want to talk about opportunities. First, I want to get your thoughts of the equities market and where you think we are right now, where you think it could be headed. Do we go higher? Um, and what are you bullish on um, and right now into the near future? Well, I said to someone the other day, um, I mean, I could argue for S&P, you know, 7,500 and I could argue for S&P, you know, 2000, you know, 2000, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, I tend to think with the inflationary future that I see that um, uh, nominally equities are going to do very well. I mean, again, I, like I said, I've done a lot of reading on historical inflations um, and uh, stocks tend to do well, although um, Warren Buffett has an article he wrote in the seventies about how inflation robs stock market investors. So it's not all, I mean, you're basically getting nominal gains, maybe, you know, not real gains, but yeah, so I can't, I mean, like I said, I'm not short, haven't shorted since 2009. Uh, as I joke uh, on occasion, when I want to hedge against capital gains, I may buy a put or two, but I'm not an options trader. And uh, those guys uh, are amazing. I like listening to them, uh, but I don't under, you know, I'm a, I'm a caveman. I say I'm a simple guy. I buy stocks with no leverage. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I sell them, you know, and sometimes I buy them. I mean, I'm very boring compared to a lot of your guests that, uh, you know, are, are real traders, you know, like uh, some of the guys I mentioned. But um, yeah, what do I, uh, okay. So yeah, so I mean, I, yeah, nominally I, I, I'd rather be in stocks. You know, I, I think I told you offline, I'd rather own Dogecoin than, than bonds. You know, I mean, uh, bonds get destroyed. Yeah, no bonds in, for me. <laughs> in inflations. Um, and by the way, just to point out, there, there's a difference between, high inflation, like what we had, you know, not, well, they said it was 9% CPI or, you know, 10, 20% inflation. That's, that's high inflation. Hyperinflation is a currency collapse. It's mm -hmm. a panic out of a currency. Um, it is a very different animal. And it's, mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons I told you I'm Rudy Havenstein is because hyperinflation is the worst possible mm -hmm. scenario for the vast majority of people. And I think that's without dispute. I personally think that the hyperinflation of 1923 in Germany directly led to the rise of uh, Hitler. Um, I mean, his beer hall push was in 1923 and he went to jail. Mm -hmm. uh, now the depression, you know, some people get mad at me and like, no, it's a depression. No, the, de the depression certainly exacerbated it, but the, the soil was laid uh, in that hyperinflation. It yeah. destroyed German morality. It destroyed German uh, society. It destroyed the middle-class and the poor. Um, and I have a whole, I have thread of many countless contemporary accounts of people who lived through it. 
and they describe quite clearly that it's the it's the uh, Larry Finks of the world that do very well, the Bill Ackmans that survive mm -hmm. a hyperinflation, and you're you you're wiped out. Um, but uh, but life goes on, but you're wiped out and you're angry, and you know you know and you and you're open to demagogues who promise to fix things. I think so your average person. So um, as for stock, what do I like? Um, <laughs> well, I told you I have a very weird portfolio. Yeah, I have, we're excited to know about your weird portfolio. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really a advertise it because basically I started buying this. Uh, I have, I have like a core holdings that I've had for in some cases thirty plus years that mm -hmm. I just basically add to when the market periodically every couple of years you know collapses. Um, I mean the best. I told a friend in 09 or whatever, uh, you know, you don't want to buy, of course, at this market, you know, you buy high and it goes higher, but mm -hmm. you want to buy stocks in size when you hate stocks, you wish you didn't own any, mm -hmm. all your positions are down, you feel like you got kicked in the stomach and you never want to hear about stocks again. I've seen this in person mm -hmm. and uh, uh, to people, that's when you buy stocks. When I you see, see that everyone hates them and and nobody wants to talk about it. That's and that's not very common in this last couple of decades because, like I said, the top priority has been pumping the stock market. Uh, of uh, but that if that ever happens, and it does happen every you know couple of years. I mean, we're up, I think, what twenty five percent just from from October of last year or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. Um, and I did actually have a post on the uh, bullish percent index right around September, I think, of of last year. You know, saying, hey, maybe it might be a time to buy, but I do very little of that because. First of all, I'm always early. You know, I always buy too early and always sell too early. Um, but you can't go broke taking a profit, right? So mm -hmm. that's a good but, buy. Um, but Better when be I like, too early than too late. Yes. Now, uh, I think I think pick bottoms are much easier. I think uh, to to see than tops. Tops are more like a process, and bottoms are like they're pretty. They're usually pretty. You know, everyone is throwing up at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, what do I like now? I mean, you know, I was listening to Tommy saying he thought um, energy was late, was long in the tooth, and it may be, but I I, I have some little um, energy companies that I add to uh, uh, periodically. I mean, I have I don't own many that many stocks. Um, maybe let me look here. Uh, you know, maybe oh I don't know, maybe ten of any significance. And uh, some of those are permanent and some of those, you know, I might sell on the, you know, if, if I think they're overvalued. And of course, if I, once I sell, then they'll double from there. But of course, <laughs> uh, yeah, I like energy. Um, utilities. He, and Tommy had said he liked utilities. Yeah, no, I don't really. Well, you know what? I own a little Berkshire and they have a huge um, utility business. Mm -hmm. So I GE's consider been that. been strong lately. GE and CEG. I just have such bad taste. See the problem? I have such bad taste in my mouth or GE over the years, you know, Jack <laughs> Welch. And then they brought Susie Welch on, on, was on CNBC all the time. It's really nauseating. And I said, I think one of the first tweets I had was like about Jack Welch. Like, I think he's the most overrated CEO in history. And that was back in 2013. But um, yeah, the worship, the Six Sigma nonsense and, and all that. Um, I don't know. I, I never liked GE. So that's the problem is sometimes like I like I don't own Nvidia, you know. I don't I don't mm -hmm. own any of the pop, popular stocks and mm -hmm. somehow I've done okay owning weird stuff. I mean, I do have a I do have a, a very uh, sort of a special situation REIT. I've got uh oh, one thing I've said I own is the Horizon Kinetics. They have an inflation um oh, what's it called? Uh, inflation fund. It's called Simple's mm -hmm. INFL. Uh this is not investment advice. This is a good way to of lose course. money. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but, but um the reason is I like, I really like Horizon Kinetics guys. There's Steve Bregman, there's, um, uh, G I think it's James Davalos, and then there's Mur um, Murray Stahl. They're all, they're very um, outside the box thinkers. Um, Stahl was one of the first guys to get into Bitcoin, which I'm not a Bitcoin guy, but I, I probably should have listened to him. But anyway, um, uh, th they look at inflation like, um, they want to find uh, companies that benefit from mm -hmm. inflation without the added added costs. Yeah. So they're really big on like royalty companies. They're big on stock exchanges. You know things where like at the CME, if um, just to throw out one of their holdings, if if trading if prices go up, we get inflation. Prices mm -hmm. go up. There's more trading. They they have to add maybe another couple servers or something. You know, but they 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 the cash register is ringing the whole time. They they really like royalty interest. I think they've got like some. You know, oil and gas royalty companies. They've got uh, 
other types of metals royalty companies where, you know, they don't have to worry about labor costs. They don't have to worry about energy costs. That's all the, the guy that's digging in the ground for the stuff. They just get paid, you know, from the production. So that they have a kind of a unique way of looking at inflation. You know, people think, oh, gold miners, you know, but the thing is gold miners, they're, they have to deal with the labor costs are going to be going through mm -hmm. the roof. They're going to be, um, you know, maybe you're in a country that just decides to take your mine one day, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of risks and they don't have a good historic track record. Although I've made a lot of money trading uh, gold and silver miners over the years. But as I say, they're really um, nothing you could recommend to hold for a long period of time because overall they kind of destroy value. But sometimes they get so beat up and hated Um like there's a there's a um, bullish percent index is a form of charting where you can see what percentage of the um, stocks in the index are are have bullish patterns, and it's a point and figure uh, chart type thing that I read got into years ago. But anyway, at some at one point, uh, I forget when it was, but that got down to like zero percent. Like every single gold and miner in the index was bearish you know and that those are the that so you're talking about extremes and that may happen once every five years or something and it happens with the s p too it never gets down to zero but i think it's gotten down uh, sub 15 percent and i've found over the years that when you get where you know 85 90 percent of the chart patterns in the s p are bearish you know i'm no chartist or anything but i'm like okay that's a sign that people are puking stuff up and um of course, it's always when you buy that you make your money, right? You know, yeah, of course. That's how it is. And they always say that in real estate. It's when you yeah. buy that you make your money. Yeah. So I, if I were to start, you know, 30, 40 years ago, because I'm not a day trader, I'm not, you know, I, I'll hold things for years or months. Um, it, I would just watch and wait for the once or twice every year or two when the market just, just you know, everyone hates stocks. And it, does, it doesn't, again, we've lived in a very weird century here where uh, 20 years where you know that's a very rare occurrence but uh we remember though we did we all we we lost 50 percent on the indexes uh from 2000 to 2003 in the in the and we lost in the s p and we lost 50 percent in 0809 and i think i pointed out before that we lost more in 0809 than we did in 1907 when we had no federal reserve mm -hmm. so um the other thing too is things like you know tarp passed and then i think stocks went down another 40 percent you know and then um you know, in oh in oh one and to oh three, two thousand one to two thousand three, um, you had the you had the composite. I think went down eighty percent. Nasdaq composite. Um, so I mean, this is all within our lived experience. Now I know everybody thinks that can never happen again, um, and maybe it can't. Maybe the Fed just starts buying stocks. You know, I mentioned Michael Howell on the liquidity. Who I listened to on that because it's way over my head, but he talks about nineteen eighty seven being on the floor. And a trader telling him that it was the the Fed was buying stocks. Now they have no, I mean, that would be illegal. But the thing is, I think the Fed's done a lot of illegal things, and Congress doesn't care. So, um, but if they were buying stock, if they're buying indexes or whatever back or spike stocks back in the '87, imagine what they're doing today. I mean, they have that whole New York Fed uh, trading floor, you know, and I'm sure Ken Griffin's plugged in and all that. But uh, I mean, look at their their advisory committee. Um, you know, it's got Bill Ackman on it and it's got, uh, you know, guys like that. Um, another thing I've sent out. So they're, they're, they're very incentivized to keep um, the stock market up at all costs. Uh, mostly because I think a lot of these FOMC members, they go to work for these guys afterwards. I mean, that's just a fact, you know. Uh, you could pretend these guys are like rarefied academics who, who are not interested in material wealth, but that's nonsense. I mean, look, Summers got rich uh, 20 years ago off of pandering to all the financial companies. You know, he made $20 mm -hmm. million, I think. Um, you know, Bob, Bob Rubin got paid $120 million at Citibank. And he basically said, I didn't do anything. I didn't, I did I had no supervisory issues. I guess his, he would just sit at his desk and think and collect his 120 million. Um, it, all these guys, uh, you know, I, I've posted many examples. They're all profiting off this. So I, so gun to head, you know, buy, buy stocks. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, yeah, but you're because I view risk as your only your only risk in is is permanent loss of capital. So I like to see companies over the years that like I mean God I remember McDonald's being something like nine dollars or something. I mean maybe this is there's been split since then or whatever. Um, and now what is it? I mean it's ridiculous. But mm -hmm. you wait for a company that you think is not going to go out of business, and wait 
again, it's like stock market in general. Wait, wait until it's just like totally hated and nobody likes it. Like McDonald's got to at one point. I guess I could look at the chart and see when that was. But and then buy some, you know. Um, I did not buy McDonald's at, at, at when I remember it being super cheap. But uh, oh, it might have been. Uh, uh, let's see. Hang on. I got my stock charts here. It could have been in the 90s. I've been doing this so long, it kind of blends in together. Uh, the, the, the some of the time periods. Let's see. It could have been. I mean, look, I'm probably thinking early 2000s. It was like seven mm -hmm. bucks back in 2003, and now it's 274. Yeah. I so see and that. and when it was seven bucks, it was down from like 29 dollars a few years earlier. So um, oh, that was uh, 2000 to 2003. So McDonald's went from 29 to seven dollars, and I remember thinking at the time, oh, you know, McDonald's not going out of business. Maybe I'll throw some money. And I didn't, but. Uh, and what happened is, let's say I had, I would have bought it at nine, then it went to seven. And then it went, it actually rode up to 20 within two years. I might've sold it then, you know, and then it went to 40 and now it's at 274. So that's, that's the thing, you know, you, you, I think my best, my biggest investments, my biggest returns have been um, stocks that I've held the longest. So mm -hmm. basically, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, so that's another indication of, of what you should be but if you if your company goes out of business uh that's bad and uh unfortunately all the all the historical memory on uh an infomercial like cnbc they they forget all the survivor bias and all the companies that went to money heaven um and you know for, you know amazon or mcdonald's has done fantastic it's up from seven to 275 bucks uh in, in uh, 20 years but um you know for every mcdonald's there's you know, a hundred companies that went to money heaven. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't, don't forget that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I guess I'm a, I'm a, a skeptical bull. I'm, I'm bull. Mm -hmm. I'm a bearish in theory, but not in practice. Exactly. Well, that's smart. You know, you need to capitalize on, you know, these equities, which we know are, you know, the greatest wealth generator, they call it the, the U S stock market and the New York stock exchange and, you know, buy the fear. And you know what? I, um, I did not to interrupt you, but that that is the impression. But let me t let me give you. I love this little anecdote um, from the uh, '80s. Oh, see, uh, let's see. There was. Let's see. And also, was wipe it. out your wealth too if you don't do it right. Well, that's the thing. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that happens especially was, with options trading. I'm an options this, trader. <laughs> but this uh, is great. Yeah. Get yo oh, yeah options. I don't like. I said when I want to when I want to lose money, I'll, I'll buy I'll buy some puts. Yeah. <laughs> the best stock fund of the 2000s was Ken Hebner's 3.7 billion dollar CGM focus fund, which rose more than 18 percent annually. Okay, that sounds great, right? Like like you were saying, this is greatest wealth that someone would just guess. They did a study where they went through and they tracked all the individual trades of everyone that invested in CGM focus fund. Okay. Which was go, which grew if you were in a coma, eighteen percent a year, right? How did investors in the fund do? The typical CGM focus shareholder lost eleven percent annually. I can send you the article. It's that's in a fund where if you would have just held it the entire period, rose eighteen percent annually, but the average shareholder lost eleven percent a year. Now, what does that mean? That means people panic at the bottom mm -hmm. and they get greedy at the top, and and I see it all the time. I, I've seen it, see it all the time. So, um, and I'm not yeah. even dealing with clients. It has to do with that. human emotion. I always yeah. say that it's behavioral that's economics right. has to do with, and that's number one, um, you know, with the investment, with business, with anything in life, it's about, it's not, you don't control your emotion. I had Denise Schull on here. She's fantastic. Um, and we talked about, you can't control your emotions. Emotions are good. They, they give you information about yourself, but it's controlling those impulses, how you react to that emotion. And when you panic, you know, I talked to a lot of stock traders and I've been trading for many years myself, you know, you, you sort of just tend to turn things off and just not, you know, you can feel the panic, but don't do anything. And you need to, it's, it's about not reacting to those emotions. So right. yeah, well said, you know, it's even though there was that 18% return, it's the people didn't, you know, they didn't, they get too fearful, then they get too greedy. It's that hum, you know, fear and greed emotions. Yeah. Um, that well, I want, one one attribute I think that's been good for me is I do not, I don't panic in, in at least in the stock market mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, I've, I like volatility. Um, yeah. I, I I do not panic. I don't sell at the bottom, and that's probably saved me. That's probably a good chunk of my return. Is that I just 
I just able to endure a lot of temporary pain if I feel that the company is not going out of business. Yeah. You know, um, the other thing I'd like to say is sometimes <laughs> I think some of the my smartest investments have been things I didn't do. You know, I don't follow the crowd. I mean, in the late 90s, I'm always early, like I said. So I thought the dot com bubble was nuts and then it went up another 80 percent, you know, mm. and I remember people at work who didn't know what a stock was, you know, three months before we're buying all of the, you know, the CMGIs and the pets.com and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and I remember just going, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to, not going to do it, not going to do it. Good and for um, you. not the IPO, and, remember the well, IPOs, they would double within a day. <laughs> well, these are all people that are still working today because they lost so much money. Some of these guys lost so much money, um, you know, in the, in the dot com bubble that it really wrecked them for years to come. Uh, and, and a lot of them did not get back into the stock market. You know, so um, yeah. uh, they didn't benefit from that. But um, no, I will tell you a, a a story about one time when I I I I'm I don't give into group peer pressure. I just don't. Um, years ago, some guys tried to get me to go to um, it was basically a cult, but they were all into it for a while. And uh, Earhart seminar training. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember this back in. So they're trying to get me to go, and they were all really pressuring me, and I was just like, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. And then they all end, ended up going from you know, true believers to, oh, it was nonsense. But, um, so, but one time early 2000, I took a small amount of money and I said, you know what, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this dot com thing is what everyone says it is. So this is like the worst time. Right. And I put it in, uh, the Munder net net fund. I mean, it wasn't a big amount of money, but it was, it was, you know, I, I did it. And, and I must, I probably marked, I probably called the top right there. For, because up to that point, I was like, I mean, I was buying REITs back then that were were in late 99, early 2000 that were paying like, you know, eight or 10% dividends and they had insider buying and they were PEs of, you know, seven. I mean, the opposite of most REITs, you know, years later, but um, that's what I was buying when everyone else was buying JDS Uniphase. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but then in Mar even, I, even I, in March 2000, I, I, I put a little bit of money into the Munder Net Net Fund, which was like the stupid it would be like buying arc you know at the peak you know, or something so um so i remember that and i haven't done anything that stupid since unfortunately it was with a little bit of money and since i started investing so young i i learned uh with small amounts of money i made my really stupid mistakes so it's better than like when you're when you're older and you have a little more money and you make really stupid mistakes but i still i see people like i know people like that that, that do that sometimes because they 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 don't know anything at all about stocks or even about the companies they're buying, but they you know they the heard they, they got the herd, a right? yeah they got a narrative they got a narrative that hey this is the future of X you know or whatever and uh, and and they get it's FOMO and um, yeah and it's nice when it's when it's going up and for mm -hmm. most people for most of this you know decade it's been going up quite well um, so anyway uh, I have fun with the stock market it's uh, it's I enjoy it. For whatever reason it's fun it's, to watch uh, and, and play and yeah you got to be careful but you know when the music stops playing you know you don't want to be hanging around you know and so the you know i want to ask you about the ai you know a lot of people yeah. compare it to the dot com and i've had shows about this uh, with people you know debating whether it's the same or different and do you believe that AI is revolutionary and is changing the way we work and live and it will be reflected in these big stocks like NVIDIA is at the heart of it. And then there was, um, let's see, there's VRT, Dow. I mean, I could just go, that's a whole list of them, the SMCI. Um, do you uh, buy into that thinking? I'm not gonna use the word narrative because that tends to have negative connotations, but do you believe that? And are you interested in that sector? Well, like I mentioned, I don't own NVIDIA and I don't, I, I, those are exactly the kind of stocks, you know, by the time they get mentioned as a new paradigm on CNBC, I don't really, I kind of lose interest. Although that's cost me money over the years. I mean, I should have bought NVIDIA, you know, or I should have bought, you know, some of these other stocks um, just because they go up and you know, a lot of people go, Hey, we don't care. We don't care about the company. We don't care if it's, I'm not talking about NVIDIA here, but we don't care if it's, a, I've had people say, I don't care if it's a fraud. I, I'm making money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I just don't, I'm not comfortable with that. You know, I, I think Tommy was talking, was it Tommy was talking about how cheap China is? 
Yes. I mean, I just won't, I just won't buy China. I mean, I, I just it's a communist country. People, you know, there's that book out called The Great Taking. Mm -hmm. And it's like if you're if people are worried about the great taking, you know, like the they're going to come and take your brokerage account. What what do you think? You know, you don't own anything if you if you buy Baba now. But but a lot of people and they argue and this is a valid argument. They'll say, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to buy it and someone else is going to pay me more for it in six months. Mm -hmm. And that's that's fine. That's just not me. Um so AI, uh, I think that the Terminator movies was a documentary. I'm very, um, I don't trust. I mean, uh, what, what's that company? Open AI. They got Larry Summers on their board. Mm. I mean, that that is a massive, massive red flag. That guy is about as deep state as they get. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've used Grok. You know, I, I'm not a big user. Of, I don't use ChatGPT. I mean, I find the stuff to be very, kind of boring you know they just give you i call you know i used to call it a glorified um autocomplete you know it I, i'm i'm sure it'll be great i mean it would be great for something so it would be great for me to be able to say to the computer sometimes hey tell me every time the fed cut rates by this amount you know what this sector of the stock market did in the next six months or something i mean you know questions i mean that's a goofy question but things like that that you could just ask and get an instant answer instead of having to do your own research that that's kind of cool um you know uh oh, you see it on the football games now this team has x percentage of winning you know the ai has calculated um and uh and i've seen some big turnarounds too like yeah you have like a two percent chance of winning and then you win the game but um so you know it's kind of cool for weird things like that. I, I'm really worried. I mean, I'm looking at this. You know, look at look at Boston Dynamics years ago, and now I'm watching something the other day, and they've got these drones, and they've got these little creepy crawler machines with machine guns on it. And I've I've seen a I saw a video of a in Ukraine of a uh, I think it was a Russian soldier getting killed by a drone chasing him around. It blows up. Um, this stuff is dystopian. I mean. It's already bad enough. I mean, I think things went sour when we started dropping bombs from 30,000 feet. But, you know, now you're just going to have machines that can kill. And we're going to trust who, you know, to to program these things. Um, I don't know. As far as I think it's already been ruined in a lot of ways by the whole woke thing where it like won't answer certain questions and won't it won't. I mean, to me, that's just unless it's honest and truthful or I mean, if you put in restrictions, it's only as good as the people that program it, I think. Now, I know it's like they don't know how it works and it teaches itself. And all. Yeah, it's just it's never going to replace me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, can, I I make a joke like, um, you know, no way I could predict that I'm going to send this picture right now, you know, or something. And and it's true. I think you'll always be able to. Um, I think maybe somebody mentioned as a thing that maybe imperfection will become, you know, maybe that'll become more important when you just see normal people like sometimes i do really crude not crude like bad but crude you know poorly poorly artistically done uh you know um memes or something because it's like it's it, i said it almost makes it more enduring the poor quality of the artwork here you know mm -hmm. but if everything's perfect like an ai yeah i don't know i don't want that i mean you already see people walking around with the headgear on and they're like talking to themselves and I, is that the future we want you know everyone to become more withdrawn and more narcissistic and introverted and I don't know. I, I mean, I guess on the other hand, I mean, I joked the other day that you could, you could probably put the FOMC out of business with, with artificial intelligence. So that that might be a bright spot. Yeah. Um, I'm really worried about the military applications of it, though. I mean, I know the argument will be, well, if we don't do it, the Russians are going to do it. And that's probably true. But um, it's it's terrifying when you just you put this machine in charge of killing a bunch of people and you hope they pick the right people. Um, but then again, these are the same people that did Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya. And um, so anyway, no, I'm not a big fan of AI, frankly. I think it's I think it's an existential threat eventually. Um, yeah. I, uh, and uh, I tend to take a, a dystopian view of it. Um, it'd be kind of cool in a lot of ways, but I uh, no, I'm not a support. Um, anyway, we'll see what happens. You know, yeah. I again, I have no control over where we go on this. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Love your insights. There it is. Yeah, very pensive and well thought out. You know, a lot of people, unfortunately, on you know social media, they just talk. You know, and they they don't put much time in their thinking, but they talk. You, mm -hmm. on the other hand, and I love this. This is what I love about your tweets. They're very well thought out. You take the time to think, and you think it thoroughly. 
and then you speak about it. And I think those are some excellent points there. Um, the dystopian, the existential threat. And I, I've heard that from, you know, other people that I've met with. Um, and they're very concerned about where things are headed. Um, but I want to talk about the last part about the market is commodities. Now, mm. We didn't get into the recession and stagflation. A lot of people are saying we have stagflation coming up or we're already in it and we don't realize it because of all the fiscal spending. Um, are you bullish commodities? You know, they, everyone talks, we're going to go back to the 70s. Even Jamie Dimon saying that now. Um, we're going to go back to the 70s plus major massive debt. So it's going to be even worse. Peter St. Ange was saying that. It's a 2070s together and, and 2008. So with that in mind, do you think we're headed to some re recession next year or stagflation? And are you bullish commodities in a commodity super cycle with gold, silver, and other metals or um, other commodities? Um, as for the recession next year, I, I have no idea. Um, when you're running a 6% deficit and you're spending money like mad, you know, maybe they can so at least try and buy it, prevent one through the recession. I mean, through the uh, election. Of course. So yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, if, you know, we, a lot of what we've done the last 20 years is borrow from the future. And um, I, I assume to keep things rolling, you know, um, uh, they'll continue to do that. And, um, you know, I see some of the, you know, the expensive houses, I, the, they're not going to be, they're not going to go down until the market crashes. And, and the other, for the less expensive houses, they're not going to go down until, you know, the economy you know, turn gets sour, uh, really noticeably real sour because um, I think right now, I mean, look at what's going on in uh, all these uh, commercial with a good economy, you know, or with a nominally good economy. Anyway, uh, so yeah, recession. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've learned enough over the years that I'm not going to predict a recession. Um, as far as commodities. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, gold is money. Uh, so uh Take that as as however you want. I know a lot of people don't like it. I'm not a, you know, I always have to say, oh, I'm not a gold bug. You know, you always have to purpose <laughs> with that. But uh, I certainly think that um, uh, it's uh, been money for thousands of years and continues to be money and will continue to be money. And um, so, yeah, I'm bullish on that. Uh, commodities, well, yeah, I mean, I have an inflationary review of the future. I mean, the dollar may do well against the euro or, or the dollar index may do well, but you're purchasing power it's going to go down over time. I I, I have no doubt. I, I don't know anything. I don't know if the stock market is going up or down. I, one thing I tell people I am 100% sure of, you know, besides death and taxes, 100% sure that a dollar will buy me less overall over time. I mean, pocket calculators are are much cheaper than they used to be. And that's great, but I don't need to buy one every, every day. And also it's not my major expense like health insurance or home insurance or car insurance. So, you know, the, the, these little things that you don't really need are going, might be going, coming down. And of course, deflation is a natural part of capitalism, especially technological deflation. Mm -hmm. uh, deflation is a good thing. Um, guy on Twitter, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jerome Powell or Darth Powell, he calls himself, has a great oh, quote. Yeah. He says, <laughs> deflation is to rich people what inflation is to everyone else. In other words, something to be avoided at all costs. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they really, um, I mean, guys like Sternlicht and, uh, and Ackman and all that, they, 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 they're counting on, uh, on inflation. I mean, I love Sternlicht. Mm -hmm. He's, he's worth 4.7 billion and he's, and he's calling for a higher inflation target saying it'd be no big deal. Well, I, I've got a several billionaire quotes, El Arian, Ackman, uh, it's easy for a billionaire to say, yeah, I don't care if the inflation rate is 2% or 4% or 8%. They don't care. Uh, it'll devalue their debt and, uh, and they'll make more money. But um, yeah, so I'm bullish on commodities, you know, like I was just looking the other day, I think gasoline's up 20 something percent year okay. over year. And, yeah. uh, and you know, so that's going to start maybe working in the CPI again. I don't know. But um, uh, but corn was down like 30 percent year over year and natural gas has gotten hammered. But, um, you know, I made the comment that, you know, corn was down 30 percent year over year. But I bet that box of cornflakes in the stores is much, is higher. Of course. You know, and that that it always seems to work that way. You know, commodities are very volatile. They'll go up and down, you know, mm -hmm. the cure for high prices is high prices, that sort of thing. But uh but uh I did I was in an agricultural uh commodity um ETN for a while. Um because I think, you know, over time food um could become more expensive. But then again, 
our efficiencies in farming are very good. Although it seems like the world, you know, the WF is trying to change that or Europe is to really crack down on normal farmers. But um, yeah, come on. I mean, it's things that you drop on your foot, but you know, they, they're very cyclical too, though. So you got to be careful. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, um, so, you know, I, I like the horizon uh, kinetic skies approach more. They're looking for companies that where their income will rise with inflation, but their expenses do not, or their, or, or their expenses rise much less than their income does. And you can go, anyone can go look at what their portfolio or listen to those guys. Um, I think they're very deep thinkers. I really like them on, on uh, inflation in particular. And if you're a Bitcoin fan, listen to Murray Stahl. That guy was in it, you know, before almost anybody in size. And so, um, like I said, I'm not a big, I should be a billionaire right now, not just from Amazon, but from Bitcoin, because Bitcoin. I could have bought it. I could have bought it all day long. Um, I knew about it. But my mistake was, I said, there is no way that the U.S. government is going to allow a threat potential to mm -hmm. U.S. dollar supremacy. I mean, we went to war in Iraq or Libya over this stuff, you know, for trying to sell oil in, you know, uh, back in the day when we had more influence on the world um, for trying to sell oil in euros or whatever or in gold. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sh sh shocked. But then I think over the years of watching it, I think crypto is very easily tracked. I think they, I think they're monitoring everything that's going on in Bitcoin. I think the intelligence agencies might have developed it. There's NSA papers mm -hmm. on digital currency, which I can send anyone who wants, um, back in the 95, 96. Mm -hmm. And they developed the cryptography. Uh, it's just all very suspicious. So there's a huge number of, um, you know, or not a huge number, the small number of Bitcoin holders that own, you know, an immense amount of Bitcoin. Um, I, I guess that intelligence agencies are using it not only for surveillance and monitoring, but also as say a source of funds for, uh, you know, uh, projects that they want to get to, that they don't want to have to ask anybody money for. So that's my theory on why they haven't cracked down. Um, when I have people tell me the, the, the maximalists who say, oh, it's going to replace the dollar as the reserve currency. Uh, I just kind of smile and nod. Uh, no, I, I, the guy that, if the if Bitcoin was a threat to, I don't mean to go off on a Bitcoin thing because I'll get a lot of people mad at me, but if Bitcoin was going to replace the dollar as a world currency, the U.S. government would do everything in their immense power to crush it. Now, people say, well, they can't crush it. It's Bitcoin. Well, okay. Let's say they make, like they did with gold. They Let's say they give you, a, you have $100,000 fine and 10 years in prison if you're found to have Bitcoin in as a U.S. citizen. So now you can move to another country, which will probably institute the same sort of things, or you or you can take that. Most people would not take that chance, you know. And of course, all the ETFs and the Larry Finks now. I mean, Bitcoin, remember, originally was as a sort of a libertarian dream, right? It was, it was mm -hmm. uh, you know. And now look who's 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 running the show. You know, you got you got Scaramucci doing podcasts on it. You got Larry Fink. You know, you got all these guys. You got the ETFs. I mean, a Ben Hunt's good on this. It's been totally co-opted. But hey, number go up, you know. So. An argument I hear a lot, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's a stock or anything, is like, I don't care. I don't care. I'm making money. I just, you know, there's a there's a great cartoon of four guys on a boat and the boat's sinking. And mm -hmm. two of the guys have life jackets on and they're just like, oh, this is great. Everything's great. And then, oh, they oh they said, I'm glad the leak isn't on our side of the boat. And you got yeah. the other two guys at the other end of the boat bailing out the <laughs> boat. That's American society right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris That's Arnaud yeah. is a great follow. Uh, he writes, he just basically goes around and writes. He's an ex Wall Street guy uh, about just, you know, running into ordinary people. And he's got done some great work. I have some um, tweeted on him, but he, our country doesn't value, our priorities are all screwed up. Tech, you know, all the wars. I mean, but besides the Fed and all that, my other big thing all these years is I am, I'm about as anti war as you can get. I mean, I'm not a pacifist, but what we've done this century. The neocons have done far more damage to the world than, you know, the Russians or the Chinese could ever do. Um, I mean, four and a half million people supposedly murdered or killed after 9-11 um, in our wars. You know, Libya, look what we did there. Obama did that, you know. Um, Iraq, what was that all about? You know, uh, and, and Afghanistan. And again, just like with the Federal Reserve, there is there's no accountability. There's no consequences. In fact, most of these guys, they fail upwards. I mean, look at Yellen. So anyway, 
in a room. Totally. Wow. No, I appreciate that. You know, that's, it, it's important to look at all perspectives and then always value your, your insights um, with that. And these, it's important to know all sides of this. And I've had Bitcoin max, I had Michael Saylor on the show, you know, so yeah. I've had all, you know, and I've had people completely anti-Bitcoin to the most pro Bitcoin. So uh, let me, great. let me say before I get the hate mail, I am not anti-Bitcoin. I completely okay. have simpatico with their goals. Um, a lot of us, a lot of these guys, young guys got brought to Austrian economics through mm -hmm. Bitcoin. So I have no beef with Bitcoin. Yeah. I'm just saying I missed the boat. I, it's my, my mm -hmm. fault, but I'm just, I'm a goal. I'm more of a goal guy. I'm old. I'm like yeah. Jim Grant. I'm old. Respect that. You know? Yeah. No, but I have totally. nothing against Bitcoin. God bless nothing you. Nothing against Bitcoin. I know. We, I have something against Larry Fink, but, but yeah, that's a different that's story. That's different. Yeah. Anyway, no, totally. Sorry to no, I appreciate. No, not at all. And so I, I think of you as more in the middle here, um, but I've had both extremes. On, on that. So I appreciate right. your insights sure. with that. Um, you know, I want to go to your pin tweet and I think we'll end on this. It's been an amazing time hanging out with you and speaking about all these issues. Oh, you're very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your pin tweet. And I want everyone to check you out on Twitter. If they don't follow you already, they have to. Um, if Nassim Taleb follows you, then they have to follow you too. Um, okay. So it says, the military industrial complex Eisenhower warned us about in 1961 and related to that, the big bank crime wave and associated kleptocracy, plus yeah. all the politicians, institutions, think tanks, economists, media fanboys, et cetera, who support one and two. So that is what concerns you. Tell us about that. Well, that's basically my, my uh, what do you call it? Uh, Raison de atur. I don't. I don't pronounce that right. I'll have to have Louis Gov tell me how to pronounce it. Re <laughs> reason for for being on on uh, on Twitter is to try and educate people about those two topics and and to have a lot of, and to have fun because I don't want to be a downer. Although sometimes maybe the the news is a downer. But uh, yeah, I mean Eisenhower warned us in 1961 uh, about the military industrial complex and also about a technocracy, which I equate with the bureaucracy and the and the Federal Reserve types. Uh, running our country. And uh, he doesn't say, he talks about a threat from within, you know, and I think that's where the threats come from. You know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a conspiracy realist, but uh, I do think that uh, they took out JFK in 1963. I am a believer in that it was not just Leah Harvey Oswald. So uh, once you do that, I mean, sky's the limit, right? And I think it's only gotten worse than, uh, than when Eisenhower warned us about the military, uh, the wars. We always have wars. You know, we ended the war finally after 20 years in Afghanistan, and then we suddenly, were, you know, we're getting into the Ukraine thing. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it started in 2021 or 2022 or whenever it did. So, you know, look, go look at some history of what happened back in 2014. But I don't want to get into all that. Uh, and Joe Biden and Hunter Biden's ties to the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. that I've also posted on, I mean, you know. Uh, and then the other one is what I've talked about most of this podcast is the big bank crime wave and the kleptocracy. I mean, I was really, when they, the end of the big short, I, I, I used as a as an example of when I got really ticked off. When I, because I had followed the housing bubble for years, since the early 2000s. And I, I saw and read and knew what what these guys were doing and they all got away with it they got away with it but but obama he made it sound like he was gonna change things and he became after george bush the bankster's best friend you know he eric holder who came from a corporate law firm that worked for the banks didn't prosecute anybody in fact, he passed the Holder Doctrine, which makes means some banks or some institutions are too big to jail. And then he went back to his office at the same corporate law firm that defends big banks. That's Eric Holder for you there. And uh, so that was our chance to change. I mean, we when they, the fact that nobody, there was no, again, accountability. That's probably my main thing lately. There was no accountability for what happened in 08, 09. When even... Smart people I like say we were, you know, moments away from the end of the financial system, blah, blah, blah. Um, there was no accountability. In fact, Ben Bernanke gets rewarded at, at Citadel. I mean, and Yellen's our treasury secretary. Uh, so that bugs me. And then the second part, yeah, the crime wave, that's what we've been talking about. Um, it's it's hurt our country. We have wealth equality that's off the charts, inequality. Um I think a lot of people are, um, you know, the cost of living 
affects everybody, but it really affects the people. I mean, it doesn't affect, you know, Bill Ackman, but it affects a lot of people. It's very demoralizing and it's a grind because they see it every day, every time they go to the store, every time they go to the gas station. I mean, I don't know if people in other states, I mean, California is, is like, you know, it's, a, I call it the people's Republic. It's, it's nuts. It's run by complete communists. Gas is six bucks here, five to six dollars. So the rest of the country, you may, you know, you may not notice it, but we notice it here. Um, it, but inflation grinds people down and it demoralizes them. And I can pull up quotes from the thirties and twenties about this from people who live through far worse than anything we're going through. Um, it's bad. And it's leading to, I think, a lot of the discord in our country. Um, now, you know, nowadays, you, it's hard to have a conversation with someone without them calling you a, a Nazi or a, a racist or whatever. Um, but when did that start? You know, a lot of people say, oh, it was Trump. And I'm not going to defend Trump. But back in 03, you had guys like David Frum were writing articles about the Iraq war and saying that anyone who questioned the Iraq war hated America and wanted our enemies to win. So that was the kind of discourse that I remember from 20 years ago. And that's, I think, when, you know, I mean, Mitt Romney called Tulsi Gabbard a traitor online, which I commented on. Um, what the F is that about? She's been serving in the military. Uh, I think she's in the uh, reserves for years. I mean, she's, she was in Iraq, you know, I mean, because she questioned something about, uh, I don't even remember if it was Ukraine or what, Mitt Romney called her, uh, she, he said she was using uh, Putin talking points and was a, a traitorous. And I mean, tra you don't call people a traitor. Mm -hmm. I, I really avoid that because to me, I mean, even I remember the Cold War when, you know, we're do you're doing duck and cover drills in, the, in school, okay? And you, you thought a nuke might land on your city at any moment. And we were very close to that a few times. And you didn't call people, even back then, you didn't talk the way Mitt Romney was talking about Tulsi Gabbard, who is, by the way, one of the few politicians I actually like, even though I probably disagree with her on majority of issues. She is right on my pin tweet. She's right on the, the military industrial complex. And and it's funny that the people that are closest, you know, I, I write some very anti-war, you know, stuff. And, but I'm never anti, you know, soldier. You know, I, I found that, Ex-military people are extremely, uh, generally extremely anti-war, because they've they've lived through it, and uh, I often get responses from people like that. Um, you know, when Ron Paul was running, you know, ten years ago or twelve years ago, his top donor list was like members of the Army, the Navy, Air Force, um, and he's the most anti-interventionist candidate of like my lifetime. Um, so why is that? Why are the military? Because he loves the military. He loves our country. That's the thing. You don't, I don't criticize central banks because I hate central bankers. I, I criticize them because I see what they do to the middle class, which is the group I identify with because I grew up in it. Um, and, and poor people. I was never poor, but I, I recognize that they have it worse than the middle class. Um, so Ron Paul, who was the most anti-war candidate of my lifetime, was getting the donations from the soldiers and the air force seamen and all that. But so that's very telling. And um, anyway, everyone should read or watch the video 1961. It's only like 10 or 15 minutes long Eisenhower's farewell address. It applies more today than it did then. And everyone, and if you, and if you got the time, check out Washington, George Washington's farewell address. He talks a lot in there about foreign policy and about not having permanent, either permanent, attachments or permanent um hatred of other countries you know um wow. anyway i'll just leave it at that yeah Love eisenhower it. and washington that's it those are the key takeaways here and we will watch Good. those um and I, I want to thank you so much for taking your valuable time to share these amazing insights and thoughts with us and you have a good moral compass and I love it. I think it's great. You want, you know, people need to be accountable and um, thank you. I just want to say thank you. So please tell our audience how they can follow you on Twitter and read your amazing Substacks. Uh, yeah, rudy.substack.com. Um, and uh, it's paid now, you know, I did it, for, There's but there's a ton of free stuff out there. So just go back like a year and I wrote a lot of stuff um, a year ago, for three to this day, I mean, 
all of March, April, and May last year, I was banned off of Twitter. I, this time, mm. I thought it was permanent. Um, so that's when I, I did a lot of writing back then. But uh, And then on, on Twitter, it's Rudy, R-U-D-Y, Havenstein, H-A-V-E-N-S-T-E-I-N. And uh, yeah, it's... Uh, well, thank you. You're a very gracious uh, host. And um, uh, thank you very much. It was, it was a pleasure being on with you. Thank you so much.